I need like a hammock today, man. We'll see if I can stay <laughs> yeah, on this stool. <laughs> it's been a Don't long time. Don't say so. the word stool. Uh, okay, yeah. it's a trigger well, word. You, you can always colon. get up for an emergency evacuation. It's been a long time, so I had to fight this hard to stay. So on what are a we stool, talking man. about here? You're, uh, <laughs> well, let's Montezuma's just, let's just set the stage. First of all. Uh, <laughs> Episode 500, I could think of no two better people or the two people that I wanted to do this with than you guys. We are reprising our New York City hotel room encounter from like four or five years <laughs> ago. What that was? We were in a we're shoe so, box. Oh we were laying in bed together. All three of us together. on the fucking bed. Yeah. Like, yeah, Sitting was, on a bed And this guy's it. not like a midget like me. He's right. fucking like 6'10 or whatever. You... And shout out to Mishka, who's <laughs> experiencing a little Montezuma's revenge oh at the my moment. God. Well, I it think was unclear little... whether you were going to post up today, but you made it. Yeah, I sold you up, man. That's it, bro. There was there was no point where I was like, I'm going to bail on the podcast, but there was one point last night where I was like, if I just die, then then Rich won't be mad for <laughs> me not showing up, right? That's but you like, were you were texting me yesterday about how bad it was, and I was like, well, this is perfect because it it basically just creates a platform to deconstruct <laughs> the you know sort of trash can fire that is your life. One <laughs> one thing I will say is, man, like remember when you used to drink yourself to this point of illness on a regular basis, constantly. Like, dude, I can't, I can't fucking believe I used to live like this, man. Like, I, I you know, this last four days, it's just been like a drug trip. I go mean, out of so your way to sick. live that way. Yeah, the yeah. That's that you would go. I pay to, to make pay sure a lot of money to feel wait, this wait, bad. Wait, wait, pay to pay to feel that way. Don't yeah. forget. No shit, man. So welcome, boys. Thank you. Thanks for having yeah, us, man. man. I'm honored, Absolutely. of course. Like to the podcast is like going through the stratosphere, like. It's been a with the guests. It's been like, a journey, man. It's been wow. a journey. But that you works. guys go back. Well you, you guys are the OGs. You go back all the way to the beginning. So delighted that, to have you. That was one of the things I was thinking when I was like biting my tongue on the way here to like stay in my lane to get here. Is that like this is a hell of a trip you've taken, man? You know, from like from being a drunk, which is like the ultimate in narcissism. You know, where you just take yourself out of the game completely, just following your own pleasure, self obsession, to, to this thing that you've created, man, of just like um, going so deep into the life of the mind and how much you've given to to me, to John, to fucking everybody, to the world. man. Mm -hmm. so. I was telling the Uber guy, he's like, "So what are you in LA to do?" I said, "Oh, you know, I'm going up to do this podcast." And I was telling him about it. And he's like, oh, yeah, wow. I go, yeah, you know, this is somebody that uh, is living a life of service, you know, to others with, you know, the amount of people that the podcast has helped. You know, it's, it's, uh, I'm not just blowing smoke up your ass, man. I get like fucking hundreds of letters a month of it, you know, that people just went down the rabbit hole in your podcast because you just cover everything and not just, you know, vegan people or whatever it's it goes just everywhere. the real people that yeah. are pushing the envelope challenging themselves overcoming obstacles and just like it's you know i i listen to probably just about every oh, thank uh, you, man. podcast appreciate that, that it's, means ama a lot. it's amazing yeah you know i mean it was it was humble beginnings i've said it before but when i started it you know i didn't know if i would do a second episode i was just doing it for fun and following my curiosity and it's just kind of organically grown from there you know it wasn't it wasn't the result of of deciding this is going to be my vocation or like whiteboarding it or creating goals or this is what i want it to be i honestly just showed up for it you know every week and it's just kind of come what it's what it's become and look you know there's there's luck involved too like i was in the right place at the right time and this medium kind of blew up and i'd been doing it for a little bit but you know it's just been such a gift and you know to your point of like uh mishka of like you know being this narcissistic alcoholic on a path of self-destruction to one of one of service i mean i'm you know first of all like I'm still a selfish bastard and, <laughs> and prone to my, prone to my, you know, ego and, and, and the victim of a million different character defects. But, but what I have learned in the hallowed halls of, of recovery that you so uh, vociferously shun <laughs> is, uh, we go. Is, is, we go. is the value of service and how, and how, 
you know, when you can orient your life or approach certain circumstances or situations that you find yourself in from a perspective of service and what you can give as opposed to what you can extract from it, um, that <clears throat> your life goes better and and actually you're 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 happier. So I try to enter into all of these with with that mindset. Right. But, I was just, that was my uh, exact conversation. You know, this guy came up from Mexico. He's you know, left a career they wanted him to be a doctor, and he's like, I just wasn't happy doing it, and you know, it's just helping other people, service to people is. I mean, I've found my happiness lies in that too. It's. But let me know. ask you this: Was he listening to the radio? No, he I've listens. never gotten into an Uber or a Lyft where they were listening to a podcast. So I'm always like, hey, he you ever wasn't. listen to a podcast? And they're like, yeah, I don't really know what that is. And, you know, it's weird. Yeah. It's like you're driving around all day. You would think more, but you more know what? ride share people He told me that's that. what he does. He listens to that's meditation cool. podcasts and, and puts them on for people. And that's cool. He actually got out of the car to pet your dog. He's like, who's this beautiful creature? But like, we, I talked to him about you know, diet and stuff too. We we had a good talk the whole time. I wasn't sitting there like a fucking, you know, That's one classic of these, JJ. Yeah. And <laughs> uh, he's like, well, you know, I stay plant-based, but then when I go to my relatives in Mexico, then they that's what they make for me. And, um, you know, whatever. Mm. Went down the rabbit hole on that one. <laughs> the, uh, the best advice I ever got in my life was from a, a taxi driver like 15 years ago or something. Of course. And... Um, he said, uh, everybody's got to work, but you get to decide who you work for. And he was like, me, I work for me, you know? And, and that, that blew my fucking mind, you know? Cause like, it was just like, oh, everybody's at that time in New York, everybody's working for startups and like, yeah. you know, you know, you gotta have, uh, you gotta have the money, you know, just this like naked fetishization of wealth. And then I was like, nah, I, I could just work for me and like for what's important uh -huh. for me. You know? You're like I got a van. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was, I was like waiting for when the car shit would come up. <laughs> Yo, I got a new truck. You, yeah, you're gonna yeah, love it, yeah. man. It's it's awesome. <laughs> I saw I a got, photo of it. I got rid of the van. It's a '92, oh, nice. man. It's a I know. I follow him and like all his tour stories. It's only twenty. It's only twenty eight like, years old. It's tight, man. It's just getting broken <laughs> yeah. in. I'm so old that when I hear '92, I was like, oh, that's pretty new. It doesn't register till yeah. we get to the seventies. Like, okay, yeah, I know. So, what happened? You were in Mexico. Yeah, I was down in Mexico uh, visiting my uncle. He goes down there uh, every year. He got sober in Mexico. He fell down, hit his head, and then he he like you know he's a religious guy, and he was like, I had a miracle from Jesus, and he just removed my urge to drink. Wow! And he so he's been sober a nine, moment, nine or a ten moment years. Of clarity. Now. Yeah. And, um, and, uh, and he went to meetings and stuff. He doesn't go, you know, anymore, but he stayed sober. And, uh, so I just go down there, you know, every year to just hang out with my uncle and like, just chill out uh -huh. what and, part of Mexico? Uh, and drink tap water. Oh man. Where in Mexico? Uh, Sayulita, which is North of Puerto Vallarta, oh, okay. it's a little surfing village. The, um, and uh, it was it's great, man, because I was like, oh, I'm going to see Rich. I'm going to see JJ. And like, I've been doing good with my diet. I started running again, banged out 10 miles the other day, like no problems. Didn't even feel sore the next day. And I was like, oh, my stomach feels a little weird. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking four days later. <laughs> like, oh. You've been laid out pretty badly. Yeah, yeah. Just like, just, you know, there's that, like the level of sickness where you're like, uh, um, am I going to die? And then you're like. Please let me die. Please just just let me die. You know, it's like last night I was sick enough that if there had been somebody there for me to cry to, I would have cried for sure. <laughs> I was just alone on my friend's couch. Like, oh God, I got well, this. <laughs> I've uh, I've stayed pretty close with JJ over the last couple of years, but I haven't seen you in quite some time, man. It's been a, it's probably the longest since I've known you that I've gone without like being in in pretty close contact with you. Yeah, I. Uh, I sort of, I sort of went off the map for a minute there. I, I went out and did five months on the road without a break. Uh huh. I never do that. Ne I, never fucking do that. I could have told it's you so that. Never. Do I told that. you that so a couple of years ago. You were playing some like crazy mm. places too. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. Basically, for people that are listening or that are new and haven't heard our past episodes, Mishka lives this life where you, you're essentially living out of your car, hitting these dive bars and doing like gigs on the on the nightly, right? Just kind of driving around the U.S. And yeah. 
across Europe. I mean, the last time I saw you, I think, was when when in, when we were in both London. in London at the yeah, same time, yeah. and you were playing a little bar there. But since that time, like that's basically what you've been doing, right? Yep, just gigging out at these little the, um, well, I, I have holes. So, like, um, what year is it? The, <laughs> the <laughs> twenty twenty. So. Uh, 2018, I bought a place. I sort of like, after five months, I just like fucking lost my mind. And I was, uh, my mom was living in Phoenix and I was like, I'm just going to rent an apartment there. And then I looked into it and it was cheaper just to buy a house. So I bought this like hundred year old house that's like falling apart uh -huh. and, uh, and moved there. And then I've, I've been, tr I've been trying to put down roots, man. You know, like my mom lives down the street now and, uh. I have a house. I got a cat. Wow. I got a little special needs cat. But how often are you there? The, um, I don't know, man. After this, after this, like I got real sick when I was in Europe uh, last summer. And then after getting like real sick again, I might be staying home for a minute, man. Uh, I'm like, I just feel, I'm, I'm not, like, I'm trying not to make any big decisions right now. Cause you know, like if you're super sick, you've been sick for a while. You know, like it seems just everything goes out the window, right? You know, your 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 image of yourself, your plans for the future, your mental health, all that shit. And right now, I'm just like, oh yeah, my life's over, you know. But no, I have a great year ahead of me, and I, I've been building a like a really good life in Phoenix. Good, I'm um, glad to hear that, man. A and I'm gonna, stability. I'm going to be taking some time off the road too. <laughs> I think you need that, to that, do that. Yeah, come <laughs> on, man. From JJ, who's been on and off the road for how many years at this 39 point? Thirty-nine yeah. years, man. Yeah. Yeah. So you just wrapped a tour recently, didn't you? Um. Yeah. We uh, Cro-Mags were out with uh, Clutch and uh, Kill Switch, uh -huh. and then before that with Hatebreed. <laughs> uh huh. And uh, then we did some, you know, you do festivals. these like big European, yeah, like, we did like Europe hardcore, oh yeah, like festivals, twenty five, thirty thousand people. We played up in Canada, uh, seventy seven festival, which is, we we don't hit the same venue. No, I know it's, moment, a, it's a different part. Part. It's a different <laughs> you know demographic. What? I gotta tell you, I'm gonna tell you right now, the best fucking gigs is not when there's a barricade. And there's all these people. It's that small venue with 500 people well, or 300 people and, packed yeah. in there. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, just going ape shit. Yeah. You know, yeah. Knocking my fucking teeth out and whatever the fuck is happening. No, I, re I remember seeing you guys in New York some years back and it was like no time had passed. You know, it was yeah. just like this shit is happening right now. Yeah. And, it, and it is. It's always just been about the connection between the people. Right. I think know? that's what that that's what keeps you continuing to do there's, this like it's there's a, nothing you know, like that, it that one on one i mean for you they're very intimate right well, like you get these small yeah, crowds yeah. of people and you have you have this like super devoted you know interesting like cross section of humanity that turns up uh, you know to I, see you play just henry mm. rollins did a did a thing on vh1 some like a year back they still show it occasionally and he was like i love henry when i left the navy i stayed at his house with Ian Mackay, and oh, but he yeah. said that uh, way back in the day, everybody, it, you know, when you saw a band, it was like the Dee Dee's on stage and you're a hundred yards away. And I was just talking with your producer and he talking about seeing Sabbath and everything. And then all of a sudden there's no barricade. And Henry Rollins said he went to see the Bad Brains and I think it was 79. And HR, the singer, jumped off the stage and knocked him down and was screaming over him into the mic. And Henry just looked at him and was like, I'm going to do this for the rest of my fucking life. <laughs> and that's the energy that uh -huh. comes from yeah. those types of, uh, of shows, you know. Well, Henry's an interesting dude. I mean, he's sort of, uh, you know, now much more of like a spoken word artist. Yeah. He gets up and does these one man shows. Amazing. I mean, he's just such a you powerful gotta get him speaker. On, man. He would be incredible. Oh, you got to yeah. get him on. And he goes on these crazy world travels where he just drops himself into the middle of like a place he would never choose to go just so he can like learn about what's going on he's in different parts of the world. He's an amazing fucking guy. And, uh, you know, I saw SOA, one of his earlier bands, and then he auditioned for Black Flag at the Bad Brain Studio, 171A. And then his first show with Black Flag was at the Mud Club. And he fucking came out, I think it was early 81, no fucking shoes, no shirt, barefoot. 
and just fucking ripped it. And I was like, holy shit, like. But he cut his teeth like the 930 Club in D.C., right? Yeah, 930 and e- even, you know, at uh, Madam's Organ and, and the whole scene that, uh, you know, back then it was like they would do shows just out in the middle of wherever the fuck. I remember they did this. There was a big show out in uh, Virginia and it was at a, uh, it was Red Sea and a bunch of other bands and everybody got in these vans. The, the bar was called The Branding Iron and we get out there. It's a fucking country bar. There's tables <laughs> up to the stage with dudes with 10 gallon hats. No idea of what the fuck is about to go down. And, uh, they came on, they didn't make it past two songs of the first band. Everybody started stage diving, wrecked the club. They called the cops. But uh, yeah, Henry, uh, you know, Henry goes uh, way back and he'll even tell you himself the greatest influence in that whole scene to him was uh, Bad Brains. And then they went, those guys went out to California and uh, checked out the whole West Coast scene you know, the Black Flags and, and Circle Jerks and Dead Kennedys and that whole thing that was going on and then brought that whole thing back right. uh, back east. So where where was Henry when you crashed with him? He was living, like, outside of Georgetown. I think him and Henry, him and uh, Ian had an apartment in uh, Alexandria, I think it was. I'm not sure. Like, uh, But was he, Black Flag in full effect at that no, point? No, it or was. was it uh, he, he had taken some time off, like SOA, State of Alert broke up. And then he was just working at like a deli uh-huh. uh, on, I think, in Georgetown. And the funny shit was I was AWOL. He let me stay there. I had right. just split from the <laughs> Navy. And uh, it was he let, I stayed there like a little over a week and eating his food every day. He's like, yo, you got to get the fuck out. <laughs> so uh, the, the, the undead played at the 930 Club. <clears throat> and uh, they were from New York. So I, I said, right. yo, can you drive me up to New York, man? And that, but uh, yeah, those, you know, and I talk about, you know, now you get these dudes going in the mosh pit and they're fucking throwing kicks at each other. And it's like, it was never like that. When I first saw it, it was like this tribal dance and you had like a thousand people and Henry Rollins just leading the pack like creepy crawling around to the dead Kennedys holiday in Cambodia. And nobody would even, there'd be a thousand dudes creepy crawling and nobody would even fucking bump into each other. Mm. And uh, So what do you think it is about him that makes him special and different? He lived this shit. He's, uh, you know, Henry just fucking lived that shit. He just said, no, I'm going to do this. And never fucking back down. He played music. You know, did, if, did, he has the book, Get in the Van. And it talks mm-hmm. all the whole fucking story about being in Black Flag. And uh, He has an unmatched level of intensity, right. too. Yeah, I mean, it's just like, you know. 100% all yeah, the time. Yeah, he's, and he, you know, he was always physically fit, too. He right. started getting into training a lot and, and uh, always keeping fit and putting, you know, never, and- what I appreciated too was the fact that, you know, he didn't get fucked up and take drugs and go on stage and make excuses. Sorry for the shitty show. Like every time he went, he's the consummate professional. He went on stage and he fucking killed it and did did it for year after year after year. And then he started writing the books. And it was always DIY, do it yourself. And mm-hmm. you know, and then yeah, Ian started one, that label, um, you know, um, what do you call it down in uh down in DC and started putting out all the records yeah. they always did the shit themselves like even but Henry's, that was the aesthetic of the whole movement yeah it was like why should these even with the crow mags when we started nobody would fucking touch us so we paid and I and, and went and did a fucking demo ourselves and it got all over the country to the point where Metallica was fucking coming to see us. But we were always like, fuck the establishment. Why are we going to wait for what dribbles down their fucking leg? Let's just go get it ourselves. They're not paying to see the label or the manager or the whatever. They're there to see the band. Mm-hmm. So let's fucking give them, you know, what they came to, to, to see, you right. know. You've always been DIY. Yeah, but I will say that the aesthetic that that JJ talks about of like 
always being there, always giving a hundred percent. That was the kind of thing that my friends and I shit on when I was, you know, when I was right. younger and we were, you know, we were like way more into like dead boys and shit like that. Oh, I was just like, you know, the, the like the fucking junkies with guitars. Yeah. The det and, and, detached and, and, irony and cynicism. Yeah, and, and you know what? Like you guys were right, man. Do you know? <laughs> like, do we you were know wrong. That <laughs> it's like, cause that Crystal, shit gets old fast. Hilly Crystal that used to own CBGBs before it closed, used to pay the dead boys with a sack of hamburgers and a, and a, and and a fucking bundle of heroin, they got and then and then <laughs> Cheetah and them would go out back and fucking in the artist alley behind CBs and fucking bang dope and like it was a different. I saw that whole junky punk rock shit in the seventies. My first yeah. girl died from that sh for, from from heroin, but you know that's what I liked about Discord. That's Ian's label yeah, and yeah. what those guys all did was it was like. Fuck that fucking sex, drugs, and rock and roll bullshit. Like, you know, we're going to fucking do it this way. And and like I said, if you live that fantasy life, very few of those people, first of all, survived it. And second of all, still out there doing it. Third of all, at the level that you could go see Henry right. and he'll still kill it or the, or Blood Cloud or Chromex or whatever. And it's like you have to attribute that to, you know— Speaking of which, that's why <clears throat> you're in LA, right? You're rehearsing yeah. with this new band, or you got well, new band it's the members. Same in band, Chromex. unfortunately. Uh, our guitar player Todd Youth uh, had a substance problem, and he relapsed right after the record, right after the first tour, and uh, he got some of that fentanyl shit that's going around, and and he he died, and uh, it was fucking, it was a travesty because he's been a friend of mine. Since he first showed up on the scene in 83 in New York, he was probably 12. He ran away from a home, and we had similar similar stories. So I was like, you know, I was like 21 and fucking street motherfucker down there. <laughs> I'm like, nobody touches this fucking kid. Like, you know, and uh, we've been friends years and years and years. We had another band that opened up for the Red Hot Chili Peppers on the Mother's Milk Tour. So we just been down a long road together and then we do this album and it's everyone's bugging the fuck out it's called up in arms and it just like started doing so well and then uh he came off tour and had problems in his marriage and sh she decided to leave and he fucking relapsed and um you know passed away it was like fucked up and uh we How waited long ago was that? about a year and a half ago now so like we waited, uh, you know, but, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, we have a, a, a responsibility in the business aspect of, like, Metal Blade, Brian Slagle fucking, we got hooked up with that deal through Tal Ronan, who owns Crossroads. He was friends with me and Todd and heard the, the demo and was like, can I give this shit to Brian? Sl Brian Slagle fucking signed us mm -hmm. with Michael Alago, who signed with Metallica, got us. Uh, the deal we wanted and um, it just so we waited uh, y you know for this time to audition uh, see, I, this motherfucker don't even have to audition I don't want to drop his name yet because uh, we want to wait till the band ma makes a statement about it but he's uh, he's a fucking virtuoso and he's been doing this shit for a long time and we're excited to have him uh, in the band and me and him um, wrote five or six new songs in New York. He's from New York, so we've been writing stuff and he learned the record. And yeah, so initially- You, you got to tell us who it is when we're off yeah, mic. I will tell <laughs> you, Dying but now. he's a monster fucking mm. guitar player. It's been in huge bands and uh, and he's a friend. And, you know, it's uh, he's clean and sober now, like any of us, you know, we all had our issues and, and, you know, soldier on, man. Joey Castillo, the drummer, had issues. Nick had issues, all of us. But, uh, you know, you, you, you're stronger as, as a team than mm -hmm. an individual. So, And that's that was the thing with Todd was he never would reveal his mind and confidence, which is one of the, the uh, um, qualities of uh, a devotee, because he was a Hare Krishna too, was that you're supposed to reveal your mind and conf confidence to, to you know other people on the path, and he wouldn't do that, and he would hide it from that he was using. But 
But that's what I, addicts do. Right. But the thing is, I've been down in that shit since 76. I know when somebody's high and I was calling him on it and then he just cut off all fucking ties. He wouldn't answer his phone, like all this shit. And, you know, anybody that's using and anybody that's getting high and, and that that's always my message is, look, man, you can't fucking do it alone. You got to you got to reach out for help. You know, nobody's going to judge you. That's what he thought. That, oh, man, I relapsed the embarrassment. Right. The embarrassment could cause death yeah. if you let it. Yeah. 100%. <clears throat> I mean, that that's the number one driver, shame, you know, especially with somebody who who relapses, who had some time or, or knows what that kind of recovery community is all about. There's so much fear and shame that prevents them from going back. And I think that <clears throat> it's, a, it's a default instinct amongst alcoholics and, and addicts to want to try to solve the problem alone. And that's driven by fear and shame, right? Like, I don't need anybody's help. I'm not going to tell anybody. I'm just going to solve this. And then I'll emerge, you know, whole once again. And that's what drives people to, you know, jails, institutions, and ultimately death, because it really isn't something that you can do alone. And oh, I'm not right, saying man. that there aren't people that have, I'm sure there are people that have gotten sober and stayed sober by themselves, but that's not the story that you typically hear. And I think, What's interesting about the three of us is that, you know, we're all clean and sober and we all have been, you know, that way for quite some time, varying lengths of time. We've done it in different ways though, right? So how long, John, like how long have you been clean and sober? Um, well, you know, speaking of the embarrassment, you know, I hooked up with the bad brains and then did all that shit in the early 80s. And then I relapsed after eight years, 88 to 90. And at first we're on crack pills, booze, the whole shit. I tried to hide it. And then it just was like, fuck that. Everybody knew. And I went through all that shit. And then the nineties, I said, I almost got murdered. And I was like, that's it. You know, I'm, 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 it was real shit. You know, I had AR 15s fucking, sh you know, the whole shit. It, it, it was some crazy shit. Right. And, um, so I I, uh, I turned to other people and got the help, you know, and, and uh, I, I I kicked right in the neighborhood walking past motherfuckers smoking crack, like in Alphabet City. But then I got completely sober, but then I started in, in 898, you know, having DJ parties and doing fucking brownies and shrooms and weed shakes. AJ from Cro-Mags used to call me Shakes the Clown because I would do these like... <sighs> you know, vegan um, lattes with like weed that I cooked in coconut oil and and I was just getting when was this? fucked up, 98. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. All the way to 2000 and then 9-11 hit and several things happened. I had to do an intervention on my younger brother again, Frank, who almost died the day before 9-11 and then take this lady called me. She's like, your brother's dying. You better come get him. And I had to go to Staten Island, drag him out of an attic, take him to my house, had him on a flight the next day to fucking rehab in St. Thomas. Boom, planes hit, didn't go. And then all this shit started happening. And I'm like seeing, you know, my father, what, what the, his whole alcoholism thing, what it did to the family. And my mother telling me she was raped. That's how I was born. And so I just started seeing so much bad shit and bad juju and uh, uh, involved around anybody that was in my life that was using that I was like, that's fucking it. And I got popped. I had a weed business. I was delivering to fucking Dave Chappelle, everybody. I didn't know this part. Oh, Dude, yeah. how many how many hundreds of hours have I been in conversations with you? I had a weed and like, business. I keep thinking I've I've like tapped out on the number nah. of stories that you have. I had a weed I business. I started working for the Popa Pot, 1-800-1-POT, but then I worked for <laughs> other services and then I said, fuck this, I could do it myself. So I got huge modeling agencies would call me. Everybody had my number, including Dave Chappelle's agent from TriStar Pictures, um, Matt Hine. So Dave Chappelle was one of my customers and I used to put all the weed... I used to ride a seven, eight thousand dollar professional bike, put all the weed inside a black water bottle in the cage, and I just rode around in bike gear, like looking like I was out for uh, a ride. And then uh, that's in, how you got into the Iron Man shit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> is it, that weed is the no, gateway but, uh, drug to uh, <laughs> to Iron Man shit. <laughs> no, but the thing was, 
It was <laughs> during the bad weather. I had somebody drive me, this guy, Scott, and just this freak shit happened. I would never, it was just, it always had to be a referral and I had to call the person. It was like real tight. I didn't just fucking sell shit on the street. So it was this fucking dumbass fucking businessman dude tells me, oh, I'm at this bar coming. And I got popped, bottom line. And, uh, and then AJ Novello, who was in Leeway and the Cro-Mags for, since 92, was like, uh, he said, you know, I talked to my, my Swami, was this, he's this incredible astrologist from India. And he'd said so much shit that fucking about people. He was able to do their charts and see- Like what, a Vedic astrologer. Dude, fucking unbelievable. From India, like the real deal. And AJ said to him, should I- I'm thinking about doing this music again, this side project with my singer. And he goes, yeah, you can do it once he gets out of prison because that's where he's going. And I was like, and he needs to stop doing drugs because some bad stuff is in his chart. And right after AJ told me that, I got busted. And then all this shit happened with, you know, my brother and all this other shit. And I'm like, you know what? That's it. So since, uh, right, since... Right, right around nine eleven, I just I just uh-huh. got sober. So fucking nineteen years, man, of uh, you know doing the do and not even like because I started feeling like even smoking weed, I had to smoke the whole bag. I had to, you know, I'm an addict. So I, I can't just. I had to smoke the whole bag of rocks of crack and then freebase and then go rob motherfuckers to get their shit, whatever it. That's the way I've always been with my addiction problem. I, I I would drink the whole bottle. I would take fucking three Placidils or two and alls or Quaaludes or whatever the fuck I was doing. And I'm like, I'm going to fucking die. It's in the cards. I got to fucking stop. Mm-hmm. And then shortly after I started, you know, training for marathons and then all, which led to- But you never went to 12 step. Never. Mm-hmm. But I I, I did move into Krishna sure. temple. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you, your your program of recovery is very much a spiritual program, but it's one of your own design. Yeah. I'm, yeah. Oh, oh, but it's not isolating. I knew I couldn't do it on my own. I had to be around people with the PMA, like I always say. And, and you know, those, those touchstones that people like yourself and everybody else who's been through it and done it and, and are on the higher path, I, I made sure that... I would fucking to the point of like, they'd be like, yo, dude, it's kind of creepy. Like how much I wanted to just, I was like, bro, I just need to be around positive people. We like, you know, it was that type of thing where I'm like, it's it's either, you know, everything is by association in Sanskrit, Bhakta Sangan, who we hang out with, we take on those qualities. And I wanted the qualities of the fucking badasses on the planet that get shit done under any and all circumstances. And I knew it wasn't going to happen. I started distancing myself from people who always made excuses and, you know, all that other shit that uh, always playing the victim and all, uh, mm-hmm. you know, always me and everyone's out there. You know, I just was like, not that I don't have compassion to try to help them, but it wasn't helping me in my life being around those people. Have you ever gotten close to a relapse since then? Not at all, man. Because that's why my girl didn't understand, Erica didn't understand why I do the Iron Man stuff. And I'm like, you know, listen, man. And and my coach uh, originally was Orion Mims. And he goes, you know, and he's been through fucking hell. He's a fucking brother. He's had a fucked up family life, African-American, boxed, all the shit. And he was like, you know, we're all running from, th- this keeps the demons at bay, you know, and- for me, it's like the writing, the training, all of that stuff uh, is what helps beat the mind with a stick every day. So, so when that, someone says to you, "You've just replaced one addiction for another," you 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 know you stopped with the crack and the weed and the booze, et cetera, and you've replaced that with Iron Man training. Like, how do you respond to that? I person? say, yeah, that and good diet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But what the fuck? Like, what do you? What would you rather be? Someone mm-hmm. just said that. To, funny enough, this is your drug, and I go, yeah, it's my drug of choice. But guess what? I get high as fuck off of it. I'm in shape. I help other people. And so, so what's your fucking problem? It's either that or you're going to fucking die. Like, what do you, what, like, yeah. what's, what's the alternative to that? 
Mishka has a good retort to that question. But well, the the thing I came up with mo re most recently is uh, no, I didn't just replace one addiction with another. I replaced, you know, in your case, the you know crack smoking, you know, robber junkie with an elite athlete who fucking inspires hundreds of thousands of people. Mm -hmm. So people are going to find a way to hate on whatever you do for you know it's a hate any culture. reason. <laughs> yeah. you had, like you told me one like, time when you got asked that question, you said the drink. Here's how I think about it. Like the drink was always the easy choice and putting on the running shoes in the morning is the hard choice. Yeah, dude, especially today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you aren't going running today. Oh man. To the bathroom, man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's about it. Yeah, the I so I I have an audio book coming out in March um about, you know, sort of how I quit drinking mm -hmm. and what my process was with Cold that. Turkey. And so I, yeah, so I I did a lot of uh, I did a lot of research into that. This whole replacing one addiction with another, it's fucking it's bullshit. It's fabrication. They there's been no evidence of people who are prone to one addiction, you know, having replacing one addiction with another. Um, and what's in f there was no research on it until the early two thousands, and then there was a, a, a study from two thousand one to two thousand four that shows that if you had um, if you're an alcoholic and then you deal with being an alcoholic, you're much less likely to have a cross addiction, you know, to develop a cross addiction to something else than somebody who's still a functional alcoholic who becomes addicted well, to but fast food there's, or coke there's something or smoking. Counterintuitive or, about that. I mean, you're saying someone who deals with their alcoholism, like if you're just a dry drunk and you've got no, you know, spiritual program, then in my experience, that person is much more likely to find themselves trying to, you know, alter their, you know, their interior landscape by, you know, gambling or sex or, you know, whatever it is. They'll find some other way to, because you're not, if you're not dealing with the underlying <clears throat> disease, that feeling of, of disease, that feeling of like not, not feeling comfortable in your own skin, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna latch on to some other way of like altering your consciousness. Yeah, I mean the I, you know I have two responses to that. You know, one thing is that um, the you know this study it's saying um, you know people it's it there's they're not comparing those people to uh, you know to normal folks. It's just comparing people who are actively practicing or actively using and people who are who are no longer actively using. Um, so I, I don't think that it's perfect data there. Um, but you know what you what you describe a, a dry drunk with no spiritual program by your terminology, that's me, bro. I know. <laughs> you're such a, Come you're, at me, you're, bro. You're, like, that's what I'm fucking, saying. So you've been hit me while I'm down, you've right? Been, you've been sober how long at this point? Uh, 10 years or, now. Or you've, yeah. you've, maybe I should say you've abstained. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm there's sober. A, I'm a not, qualitative difference. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I wanted to, you know, to address, um, you know, is I, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not clean by that terminology. Like I, you know, I use uh, mushrooms a couple times a year infrequently I'll smoke pot or mm -hmm. something like that. The, you know, more and more though, like, you know, I have a bag of mushrooms in my freezer and it's been there really? for eight months, 10 months. Like, I just don't have the time to get around to doing it. Um, cause uh -huh. I'm doing other shit, you Interesting. know, well, um, but I just wanted to uh, sort of fact right. check that. Okay. You know? Well, one thing that I, I look at it is, and I always said this, the amount of time and effort and energy that goes into maintaining a habit, if you redirected that energy toward anything positive, for me, it was like, I'm like, all the shit that I had to go through to get the coke Exhausting. to freebase it. And in my case, it had to do with like strong arm robbing motherfuckers, which could get me killed. And the amount of energy... Even even a junkie who has a bundle a day habit, and I see it all the time still to this day, there's functioning junkies out there who can hold down a fucking nine to five, put on a fucking suit, and they got a habit, and they got to do a bundle a day or half a bundle a day or whatever. What's interesting about those people is I think most people would be surprised at how undetectable it is. You know, there's a lot of like Unless sort of, you really quote unquote around like, you it. know, yeah. functioning heroin addicts or whatever. And you, yeah. you can't necessarily tell. I can tell. Because you have this yeah. image from television or whatever yeah. that, you know, is a, like a, a dude who weighs a hundred pounds and, you know, nah, his man, eyes it ain't are like that. There's dudes that are fucking popping 
fucking oxys and all kinds of shit. And it's like, unless you really know, and I've been around, like I said, since I'm 13 years old and I'm fucking 58 this year. So that's a lot of years in the fucking trenches of the drugs. And I, I can pretty much tell. But I always said, dude, if you guys... If these junkies allocated that amount of time, they could be running fuck, fuck, fucking 500, Fortune 500 companies. I'm like, holy shit, the creative shit that they had to do. Right. Fucking. The resilience. The story. And the resiliency yeah, the every and, fucking yeah. day and the scams mm -hmm. and the schemes. I and I, I mean, I was there doing it myself, but I'm like, I just. It's not replace. It's 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 redirecting your energy at more than it is replacing one di addiction for right. another. And the thing is, when I redirected all that energy I was wasting in getting high and all the other bullshit, the negative bullshit, my life started taking a very positive turn. And I was a thus able to tell other people going through it, like, "Yo, here's what you got to do: replace all that energy. Put the energy here. You know, go go fucking do this." You know, and um, similarly, this is a conversation that dates back to <clears throat> the the first day that I met Mishka shortly after the long run came out. The amount of energy that that Mishka puts into resisting uh, like a spiritual program, we'll just call it that. Uh, if I stop be, resisting, what are we going to have to talk know, about, man? Like, it's like a, a it quit you, getting called to be on the podcast. Imagine the world that would open up to Mishka if he would avail himself of the, you know, the higher powers that be. Look, well, look at it this way. You know, like the, you know, you're familiar with the, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. I'm you know? very but familiar like, with that. We're, if, we're in that know, dynamic right now. There are, you know, and there are <laughs> yeah. like, you know, and there are also, there are like, you know, there are dogs that like just want to sit on the couch and smell their farts all day. And then there are dogs that want to run. And like JJ is a dog that wants to fucking run, you know, like give I him smell something. my farts too. <laughs> <laughs> give him something to pull against and he'll pull against it. You know, the, you know, but like what I, I'm going to go into it with this. I'm going to say thank you to both of you guys. Cause like I was thinking on the way over here, I was thinking, you know, thinking about the PMA shit. And again, it's one of those things when we were kids, we used to mock that shit and you were right. And we were wrong, you know? And like, I need to get more of that in my life. I, need I brought a copy of the book for you. I don't know if you have it, <laughs> right. but I did. Yeah. I said, this motherfucker <laughs> needs to get the book. So I got one for you. Got to get right with But God. your book, The Long Run, holy fuck. Uh, thanks, Fuck, brother. man. Yeah. Holy shit. If you haven't read it, you know, and you're dealing with shit, go get that fucking book. Right. And just so people that are that are listening, if they're newer to the program and don't know the history here, like we go way back. Like we were, I met you early days of the podcast. You had written this Kindle single, The Long Run, that was like the number one best selling. I think it probably to this day is the, the biggest selling Kindle single ever. Unbelievable. Right. With the Nike shoe worn out yep. on the cover. That thing still sells like crazy. And uh, that's Change, what brought, that's what brought my us, fucking yeah, life. That's what man. brought us together. So it's like a little, you know, it's a, it's it's longer than a short story, but shorter than a typical book, and yeah. it kind of tells this story of how you um, got sober and discovered running and became this ultra runner. And let let's not forget finding ultra. I mean, oh yeah, that, that was, book is know, fucking game. You know, I read it out on that, the road but, when I'm in the van. I told you, remember? I'm like, holy shit, I just. Reread your book. Again. I, I love the story about how you guys met, where JJ cornered you and like, who is this it guy? It was through <laughs> Brandon. I kept writing him, and I'm like, motherfucker, what the fuck? This I guy's not it. writing me back. I like, vividly now, like we were at we were at the Sea Festival in, in New, New York, York and you like chased me down a hallway or something. And I was no, just, we were in the I big room. And Brent, I was like, I go, <laughs> who is I go it? to Brandon. I'm like, yo, that's that fucking rich old guy. <laughs> Yo, bring me over there, man. I want. I don't remember getting emails from you though that went no, it was on. To. Uh, it wasn't never emails. It was on social media. Oh, uh, so well, I was sending why. you messages on yeah. like Instagram or whatever the fuck, and you never wrote even, me back. I don't. I'm read like, that yo. Stuff most of the time. And then I said to Brendan because he knew you. I was like, yo, introduce me. And I was like, yo, motherfucker, like, what the fuck, dude? <laughs> I'm glad to meet you. <laughs> you I've been I'm like, <laughs> what do you want from me? <laughs> Jesus, I love you, anyway. man. <laughs> But the, you're not getting my Bud Light. Uh, <laughs> this this is one of the ways in which I will defend my path is that my existence proves that you can change your life without swallowing the God pill, if that's so objectionable to you. Having been sober for 10 years, I'm far more open to 
spirituality and PMA and like, you uh-huh. know, that shit that I, than I ever was before. But, you know, that's, you know, that's one of the issues that, you know, I had with like veganism is that it's, it's very like Catholic. It's Cult. either, either you're like, Cultish. it's either you're righteous, you know, and like no, you know, um, no animal, anything will ever pass your lips or you're an outcast, you know, and obviously that's, you know, dramatic, but there's a lot, yeah, you know, that, dramatized, that, but that, that's dramatic. And there's also a lot of projection in that too. Yeah, right, I mean, right. Certainly, but, but, but people say, but do sure. people do say that, you know, right. and, and that's how a lot of people perceive it. And that's, that's one of the things that I think prevented me from getting sober for a long time was that like, it's not just that you need to, to stop the only thing in this world that you're good at, which is fucking drinking high life and sitting on a bar stool for 12 to 14 hours. <laughs> but also you have to believe in God, which is something you've never had and you've never needed, mm. you know? Well, and, but that, that's not, that's not completely accurate. I mean, basically the, you know, in, in, in 12 step, we, we got to be a little bit careful here. Cause I don't want to like, run too afoul of the of the traditions but the only requirement is to have a desire to stop drinking and in terms of of god it's just it's just a belief in a higher power and what i always say to people that have issues around god or have a lot of baggage around the church or etc or whatever you know that's and i would put most people in that category is that it's a higher power of your design. It doesn't have to be the God that you grew up with or whatever notion of God, you know, is problematic for you. Uh, a higher power just means a power greater than yourself. That could be a collective, a, coll- a group of people, you know, in a room who've all stayed sober longer than you and have some wisdom around how to do that, that you can um, summon enough humility to kind of, uh, you know, have the willingness to do what they say as opposed to whatever you want to do. Rich, I love you to death and I believe in higher power, but if it's higher power and not God, why does it say God so many times in the fucking book? Well, you, there's there's a lot of colloquialisms in the book too. You have to also understand that it was written in a certain time. So there's a lot of things That's in the, the book thing, that That's the thing is the time weird. it was written in, but God was God. And, it, and it, it's a book. Oh, all right, I'll, I'll slow <laughs> down here, but it's, it's, a, it's a book for straight white men who believe in a Catholic or a Protestant, a Christian God. You they know, go and, out of their way to use higher power. I hear what you're saying. I, I understand. I'm not but, against AA, but I do think it needs to evolve. And I think that's something you're arguing in favor of as well. Um, I don't know that I'm, I'm not, listen, you know, I got, I got sober in AA. It keeps me sober. It's an incredible community. And, you know, it, it's, it, you know, and my participation in that community <clears throat> is the number one priority in my life. So, you know, I'm a champion of it. And I'm always constantly saying, like, people need to set aside whatever preconceived ideas they have about what it is and what it isn't and just, you know, show up and with an open mind and listen. And I've seen incredible miracles happen there. Um, But in terms of my open mindedness, I'm not going to be the person who says it's the only way to get sober. I mean, both of you guys are are examples of people who have gotten sober, you know, via different modalities or in ways of your own choosing. So, um, you know, that being said, like, I'm, I'm certainly not going to be dismissive of 12 step either. You know, like, I think it's, I think it's one, of, I think it's a, it's a, a, a miracle of our time that not only has it persisted over the years, but it continues to grow and flourish and hasn't sort of, um, you know, self-destructed because human beings are, are behind it. The most fucked up, you know, human beings you can possibly imagine. I mean, just think about this for a minute. You're going to get together all of these insane alcoholics and addicts who are all completely fucking out of their minds. See, right? this sounds and awesome. It's just like, a sobriety and there's thing. An that's organiza- like, there's an organization. Sounds like an awesome party until. Like, <laughs> explain to me how this organization didn't just completely implode within 30 days of its being constructed. You know, sheer force of so, human will. It's a, it's an incredible yeah, thing. Yeah. And it's know? helped, you know, thousands and thousands of people. And like, look, a lot of people relapse and die. Like I know a guy who I just found out the other day who I knew quite well relapsed and died. I mean, that is just part and parcel of, you know, being an addict and an alcoholic. I mean, this is real life shit. The consequences the are as high edge. as they get. You're you on know? the razor's I'm, edge. So, I'm not anti-AA and I hope that I've never uh, present, you know, misrepresented no, myself but this as is being the, this anti-AA. This is the kind of jocular, you know, the, um, tennis I, match I just, that we're always in. Well, no, but I just, um, I, I just praise other, other methods of getting there. That's all. I just think that there needs to be more different, you know, f- for every, I mean, and look at it. So AA is this miracle that happened. Can't we, 
conceptualize in our mind eight or nine or 10 or 20 other similar miracles like AA happening that still help people get to sobriety and to the life that we've found. The the only thing I would say to that is that when I get contacted and I do every single day from people who are out there who are struggling, who, you know, can't, can't get sober. um, I don't, I'm not going to be the person to say to that person, oh, well, you can do it your own way. I'm going to be like, here's what you do. And I give them very concrete, direct actions that they can take that have, in my experience, you know, proven to work when they're done, you know, with, when they're done properly, as opposed to like, well, there's lots of ways, like you go figure it out. Like, you know, that's, I can't, I can't say that to that person. I, I smile because yeah. one of my writing students, like, you know, he, he wants me to explain, oh, how do I get from here to here? And I'm like, well, fucking figure it out, dude. You need to be able to know how to do this. I can tell you how it's done. But as a writer, you need to be able to solve these problems. And every time I say figure it out, he like threatens my life. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> I have a friend that uh, he's very involved in the, in the ayahuasca community and um and, you know, he recently told me something because, you know, I kind of slagged it, that whole hallucinogenic thing in my book. And, you know, at first just the ego, I'm like, what are you talking about, man? It's fucking drugs. And then I'm like, wait a minute. You know, this guy's helping people that have been stone cold, straight up. You know, Jonathan Shaw, the famous tattoo artist and everything. Mm-hmm. And he's a really good friend of mine. I knew, I, you know. Oh, is he the one who did that book? Yeah. Yeah. And he's uh, he's done a bunch of books. um, Johnny Depp put out his book. Um, But he goes, hey, man, you know, like, I just want to tell you, I have a ton of respect for everything, you know, you did. And we sat down, we were at Juice Press in New York. He goes, but listen, man, you know, you shouldn't be dissing this. This This is a ceremony. This is like you know, some magical stuff that's going on. And I've helped people um, that have been stone cold fucking junkies for 20 fucking years and nothing worked for them. NA, they got sick of going to the rooms. It just, all of that stuff. And then we go down and we do these ayahuasca ceremonies under, you know, a master that knows how to do the whole thing. And he's like, dude, they they just fucking gave up the drugs. Mm. And I'm like, you know what? I said, you know what, bro? You're right. And and I won't, uh, it's not for me, but I'm yeah. not going to diss something that's helping a lot of fucking people. And they were able to clean up and get off drugs through that particular um, modality. Yeah. yeah. I mean, one of the kind of core uh, sayings in recovery is like, you know, don't don't succumb to contempt prior to investigation. That's what right? he told me. He goes, and, he gave me that fucking quote. Oh, he he did. Yeah, that's yeah. what he read to yeah. me. He 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 gave he told me that, and I was like, yo, you fucking. And right, I say man. that, yeah, and I say that to people who have a lot of baggage around God, right, or AA, or they just they have this they have this concept or this image that was formed through a television show or whatever about what it is, and I just say, you know, don't don't succumb to contempt prior to investigation. Go check it out, and and. I too have voiced opinions about ayahuasca in the past, um, but I've never done it. So in many ways, that's contempt prior to investigation. And I too know of people whose lives have been improved as a result of that experience, but also like you, it's not for me. Like yeah. I'm not gonna take a, such a powerful mind altering substance into my body at this point right. in my evolution. Like, I don't think it would be wise and I don't feel like I need it, but I also can't discount the truth that certain people have been impacted positively as a result of that. And I know that like people like Gabor Mate take right. addicts through this experience and have had positive results. But I also know people who then, I wouldn't call it a dependence or an addiction, but continue to go back to those experiences yeah, time and time again. It's like, I don't know anyone who's walking around enlightened because of ayahuasca. Like we kind of, you know, go back to our set point. Maybe that set point moves a little bit for certain people. Um, but if I see a guy who's doing it every weekend or that's, doing it every month- That's an addiction. That is an addiction. You and I know people. Oh, that do I know that. You know what I mean? Yeah. So 
Um, that's where I start to think, well, if this is so effective, then why do you have to keep doing it? Right. You know what I mean? Or, well, I mean, and they'll, well, call it when, the, they'll call it the work. And like, right. and again, I don't have any experience with it. So I'm not saying this with judgment. This is pure observation. Whenever you guys change your mind and you want to do it, let me know. We, we're going <laughs> to so all do we'll, it together? Yeah, oh, we'll go shit. in together. That's a podcast. Can you imagine? <laughs> That's a fucking You know, podcast. you're going to feel like what you felt like last night or maybe how you oh, feel right man. now. The, well, uh, the, one of the things, I just before I forget, uh, in discussions of AA and my resistance to AA, you know, the, you know, John, you know, pulled up a perfect example of this and I do have resistance to AA and I, and I have problems with the structure of it. And at every point when I'm being critical of AA, I always feel like I have to move very carefully and very delicately because fortunately I have people like you in my life who have benefited from so much wisdom from the rooms, shit that I hear in my day-to-day -day life that resonates with me hard core and come to find out later that it's it's you know it's an old AA truism or it's from directly out of the big book or whatever so you know i mean i i hope you don't think that i'm coming out you know fucking knives and guns and all that shit you know but because i know that um i you know second or third hand my life uh -huh. has been enriched by the wisdom of people in the rooms you right know? so I, I hope you know that when i am critical about specific things it's it is in a the most sort of like loving respectful way possible because i know right. that i've benefited it's from still it, so funny know? to me too though because like you said all right set aside the god part of it right you're like i have problems with the structure like for me it's like all right a group of people who kind of share a certain kind of problem get together and they they talk about it they share their experience their strength their hope uh from a perspective of trying to be of service to each other a support system and then there are these tools like hey if you do these like things like kind of take inventory of like how you've lived your life and you, you know, you, you mend these bridges with the people that you've harmed. Like these are all, you know, ancient traditions that transcend <clears throat> a book and a room and a program and a group of people that, you know, if you detach from the labeling around it would just be like kind of smart, common sense things to do to kind of, you know, improve yourself and your life experience. Yeah, I have that group. Yeah around the world okay. in my life, man. It's awesome. <laughs> right. They're like everywhere I go. And a lot of them are like fans of yours, you know? So I don't like, know how you go into the, these, uh, these bars night after night that like that would wear on my soul. I just remember how I feel right now. People drinking all the time. <laughs> I just remember it, this yeah. dog shit feeling. I mean, for me too, like one of the things I always said was growing up music, how important it was in my life. You know, my father was breaking in, raping my mother and beating her. And it was always the music that, um, you know, to address what you're doing because you're getting something out of it. That's what keeps you going for five yeah. months on the road. And when I was in the foster homes, it was always music. When I was on the streets, it was music. When I was locked up, it was music. And then I got the gift from HR who took the mic and said, yo, get out there in 81 to play music. And... I always would get in the worst places in my life when I walked away from mm -hmm. the music. It's it's part of the whole process for me too of of staying sober is having those shared experiences with people uh, in a room. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be in a room uh, doing the twelve step program. A room to me is like we're playing for all these people, and then you have these amazing conversations afterwards and. It's not involved. It's not revolving around, you know, we're fucking smoking weed and having fucking drinks and doing all this shit. It was always like we're having these like fucking philosophical discussions. And what's interesting is I won't mention the person's name, but even the walking tours, uh, some dude hit me up and was like, got out of prison and he's no fucking joke. He's a fucking big, fucking strong, tattooed fucking maniac, has kids, got out of prison and was like, um, I fucking had a gun and I was gonna fucking end my life cause I went back to addiction. And uh, I started listening to the podcast, Rich Roll and listening to the message and got your books and all this stuff. And like, and I was like, but at first he was like, you know, I'm going to write John on fucking Instagram. Let me write this dude. And I just happened to be fucking looking at my phone. And he's sitting there with a fucking gun. And he was like, if I don't hear 
if I don't get to talk to somebody now, I'm going to fucking end it. And uh, it was, I was like, holy shit. And he came out on the walking tour. And was so like, what did you say to him? I, so you just, re- he, yeah, he I just kept that going, like listen, man. And you yeah, he just to him? Talk, I just kept telling him about the positivity, man. Don't isolate. Don't do this. You Listen, you got to get past it. The fucking check out my book. Do this, do that. Go on these podcasts. Listen to this shit. Like, we all been there. Like, he didn't say, the words never came to me that I had a gun and I'm sitting there. It was always like, he just kept it. He he was asking me questions. Mm. I found out later because he came when on the walking tour. When he came on the tour, tour then he told you that. He fucking waited till everybody else left. And he was like, dude, I just want you to know, like, that day I was going to end my life. And, like, the fact that you responded to me. And that's the power, too, of... You know, the social media and the meeting of people in the rooms and, you know, and and the gigs and the concerts. It's like, I think there's so much good that can come out of that, too. Like, there's so, it's a platform, Mm -hmm. you know, to to really do a lot of good shit. And I find, like, when I step away from the music and it's kind of like part of the whole thing for me is uh, to be doing this and... um, using these platforms uh, yeah it's your relationship to the platform and yeah. how you use it it's like a metaphorical I mean, room you know, because like yeah, yeah, you yeah. know yeah you're fucking you're getting people hitting you up too like fucking yep. and it's like doesn't necessarily have to be we walk into the basement of a fucking church but it's there nonetheless it's the room is where you create it you know yeah, I get that. I mean, I I, I threw out a, a tweet thread on New Year's when I was in Australia, basically saying like, you know, it's always a gift on New Year's Day to wake up sober. That's when you really like, know, you're them. like, yeah. And it was a bunch of stuff about like, cause a lot of people are gonna wake up on New Year's Day feeling like shit and you know, thinking yeah. like it's day one and I'm not off to a good start and maybe it's time to reevaluate. So I, every year I kind of throw something out like that. And I just ended the thread by saying, you know, my DMs are always open to anybody who's, you know, in that state right now and wants to talk. And I just got tons of messages and made sure that I responded to all of those. And like, that's that's the service and that's what it's about. And that you could, you know, there's a lot of problems with social media and, you know, on a macro level, what it's doing to culture and society. But if you can use it for that purpose, you know, and-, and Like you know, today and, and I read- Leverage it for, to be of service. It's an incredible tool. Today I read your post about the Australian fires because you were there yeah. watching it firsthand. And it's just, I mean, it brings fucking tears when I'm seeing what's happening to these animals. And, and uh, you posted some charity links, which I'm going to mm-hmm. be donating to and the money goes right to the organizations. And it's just like, we have to- as a fucking humanity needs to start making a global shift away from what the fuck we're doing and the path we're taking. And this, you know, so many signs of it. I just saw another documentary about Venice that the sea level's rising. The place is going yeah. under fucking water yeah. and they're losing these history. museums in history yep. and they're freaking the fuck out and just everything that's going on. And I made a post yesterday uh and it was like you know it's somebody saying what if we create what if it's a hoax and we created a better world for nothing like oh yeah I saw it's that. like yeah. fucking come on man like <laughs> dude like you know <laughs> but I, oh, well. speaking of social media i don't know if it's what a waste of time and energy like, you know i i just saw your post and because you were over there yeah i was your over there vacation. for a month and were you affected by the fires? I well, mean, where, where here, were you? I was in Sydney for most of the time. And Sydney is not under imminent threat from the city burning down. I think, you know, I could be wrong, but I believe that the closest bushfires are something like 50 kilometers away. Um, so it's not as if you can see the fires from the city, but when the wind's blowing a certain way, as it does on most days, um, the the air was, you know, the air quality was unbelievably poor. And there were definitely days where, you know, I'd go outside and think this is not a good idea. And you'd walk around and people have got, they have masks on, the sky is orange, uh, you know, walking around the opera house, you couldn't I see, saw, you couldn't I see across the, yeah, you couldn't see across the harbor. <clears throat> the bridge was obscured because of the smoke. Um, it was bad, you know, really bad. So I didn't see the fires firsthand. Um, and what's interesting is how, you normalize what's happening. Cause I was there for, you know, this is, 
these fires have been going on for four months, right? Yeah, and since, I was since there September well after they had begun and it's gotten worse since I've left. And I know I've been talking to friends there, the air quality is even worse than it was when I was there. But everyone's, you know, it's not like life stops, people are going to work and going about their day because what else are you going to do? Um, and even being there, it's hard to grasp the scope and the size and the sheer devastation and the impact of what's happening there. I mean, it would be as if you saw those maps of Australia superimposed over Jesus. the United States yeah, with the fires. Crazy. And it's like, it would be as if, you know, fires are burning from Miami to Portland, Maine, you know, like, it's and insane. then up around across to Chicago or something like that. Yeah. You know, it's unbelievable. So, you know, what do we do? Like it's in that first post that I made about that. I mean, I think that the impulse is to feel powerless and that the world is out of control and there's a kind of desperation or, a, you know, sort of a, a hopelessness uh, that comes with, you know, acknowledging that level of dystopia. But, you know, the truth is there are things that, that we can do. There are these relief organizations where we can be immediately of need to the people who need that. And then there are ways of dealing with and addressing the macro problems that are, you know, shifting the tectonic plates that lead to these sorts of things. And they're less sexy and, and they don't necessarily, I think we need change at the highest level and it's important to, you know, let our governments know what's acceptable and what isn't, but there are changes that we can make right now in our homes and in our daily habits that don't seem like they're connected to this problem, but ultimately are. And if we want to <clears throat> solve these problems, we do need to take responsibility for those choices and how we're living our lives on a daily basis. I mean, there's, I just saw a huge disconnect, like all the Amazon that's being cleared and burned to graze cattle and grow crops to feed the cattle. And it's like the Amazon are the lungs of the fucking planet. And it's like nobody really said anything about that or, and, and then like- and These now, fires dwarf that in yeah, size. Yeah, but- Not that they're, they're being burning cleared the for rain cattle. Farmers, but, the rainforests all over the planet. They're doing that everywhere now. Like my friend said to me, like, how come nobody talked about what's going on in uh, Indonesia and all that, what they're doing over there? And I think it's- That's whataboutism though. Yeah. You know, anytime you, you sort of right. shine a light on something then says, well, what about this? You're talking yeah. about this, but nobody, you know, it's, it's like, that's not productive. Right. You know? Or, so, or if you say, hey, there's a problem here, let's look at it, then, then you know, you, or somebody attacks you because you flew on an airplane. It's like, yeah, yeah I flew on an airplane. Like I'm not, I don't, you know, I don't live a zero carbon emissions life. Right. And I've never said that I do. There are certain things that I do, I have habits around that hopefully are part of the solution, but I'm not perfect. And, right. you know, like I say this all the time, like I have an iPhone, where do, the, where do these minerals in this phone come from? Like. You know, I'm complicit in whatever that system right. is that creates that, that probably is creating a lot more harm than good. So it's it's not about puritanism, but I think it's about raising collective consciousness and awareness. Oh, absolutely. Mishk? The, uh, I wanna steer this back to, to a, a, something we talk, we always talk about, the, um, the service thing. You know, the, um, because when you're confronted with all these huge problems, it's like, well, what, like, what can I do? How can I help? You know, mm -hmm. the, and, and also like the, you know, the attacks you get from people of like, oh, you have an iPhone, you flew on a plane, all that shit. I think that's one of the reasons why I struggled with the idea of service initially is because I feel like if you're a sober alcoholic or, you know, drug addict and you come out of either you come out of rehab or you come out of a program or you come out of fucking white knuckling it in your room. And then people are like, oh, you now need to be a better human being than everybody else. You know, I to me, it just felt like I don't know that not that like. Not that sober addicts and alcoholics should get a break necessarily, but they shouldn't have, you know, they shouldn't have every, like this service thing should apply to everybody or nobody. Um, so the, what are you saying specifically? I mean, certainly, look, well, the, it's, it's not about like it, it goes back to not being about Puritanism. Like, as they say, we are not saints. It's about spiritual you know, progress, not spiritual perfection. And yeah. the truth is, if you've cobbled together a few days of sobriety, then you have a kernel of experience that would be beneficial to somebody who can't get one day, 
You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And for the amount of time that you've remained sober to somebody who's in that position, you're like a God. Like how, how would, how, you know, how is that even possible that that guy could do that? And, and that, you know, so detaching that from whatever other decisions you're making in your life that, that, you know, make you an angel or a devil, like let go of all of that and just focus on the fact that you've been able to string together some time without drinking or using drugs. And, and how can you communicate a message to that person who's in that vicious cycle, who feels like they could never escape it so that they can hit the pillow that night, just one night without, without getting loaded? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, part of this goes back to the, uh, oh, you're replacing one addiction with another, that kind of shit too. You know, where I feel like, um, you know, sober alcoholics and addicts are like subjected to all this bullshit from people who like feel like um, it's their business to to weigh in on our lives and the decisions that we're making. And like, oh, is that healthy for you to be running the oh, amount right. that you are and that kind of shit? And um, somebody asked me point blank, you know, like, well, what do you think your debt is to um, to other people, you know, trying to get sober? And I said, nothing. I, I owe them nothing. I'm if I help people, it's going to be because I want to and not because I have some fucking obligation. It's not like you need to do your homework or you need to clean your room. Mm. You know, I, I mean, and that's the thing about my sobriety is like I got sober on my own. I, I didn't lean on anybody else, you know. And so, like, I'm happy to have written what I've written and I'm happy to help people where I can. But I hate this idea of I'm down with I'm coming around. I came around on PMA. I came around on plant based. I'm coming around on service. But I, it's just the, I guess it's the mode of entry of, you know, that like newly sober addicts are compelled to do this, you know, rather than here's an opportunity for you to, you're looking at me. Like, are you done? <laughs> no, go for it. <laughs> first of all, I would call, I would, first of all, all right. I would go. I would, I, would, I would call into question that you got sober on your own. I know you want to believe that. And I think that that's on some level a delusion. I think that you got sober because you're surrounded by people that love you. And they may not have been, you know, wrapping your knuckles and telling you what to do specifically. But don't discount the impact that, you know, your family members and your friends may have had on... <clears throat> Your sober story. That's one thing. But and I think the wanting to yeah, go know ahead. how your addiction you just spent time with your your old man, right? Well, that's a whole other thing. Well, and I'm saying like, <laughs> I know it crossed your mind at some point what your so what your addictions were doing to the other people that Yeah, you know, yeah, that's absolutely. Right, you know, the connection. Yeah. That's that's what you know we keep talking about with music, with performing, with right. it, it all comes back to connection. Right. You know. And, and, and that connection is fundamental to you getting sober and staying sober, right? The fact absolutely. that you have a connection to other human beings. And there in have absolutely of, been times when I've been in those fucking dank, wet right. bars when I think of the two of you. And that's, you know, one part of the barricade. Right. Know. So, so you know, my voice is in your head on some level or JJ's is in your head when you're in a situation that you know is somewhat precarious. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. So how much are you doing this alone? So there's that. The, the yeah. second thing is we can move along. The second thing, the second thing is, <laughs> Wait, I, you I find proved, this to be you proved your yeah, point. Exactly. Uh, no, I get to yeah. rebut too. <laughs> I rebut your I think, rebuttal. I think there is a spiritual truism <laughs> that um, if you want to keep something, you have to give it away, right? Like if you want to be loved, you have to give love. If you want to stay sober, you have to be of service to other people who are struggling in sobriety. If you, whatever it is that you, and if you hold on too tightly to a certain thing, that's a sure path to losing it. So I think that is baked into this idea of what service is. It's not like, hey, go be a good Boy Scout and you must, you know, you are compelled to be of service, but there is a priority or a, or a, um, you know, a lot of energy behind kind of getting people energized around that because that's what keeps people sober. So I know that if I'm on the phone on the daily with somebody who's in and out and who is struggling, that that makes me um, work my program more strongly because you can't give away something you haven't got. And I'm duplicitous if I'm telling that person to do one thing and I'm not practicing it myself. So it keeps me honest. So the giving it away, really, I get, I get more out of that than that person. That person may you know, never get sober. But it's like an insurance policy for myself 
that Absolutely. I know that whatever that guy or woman or whoever, whatever that person does, like I'm pretty sure that my head will hit that pillow sober tonight. Yeah, I listen, I totally agree. And, and I mean, that's what I said, you know, when I'm coming around to the idea of service, because like, you know, when uh, the rare instances where I've done something to help another person, I always feel good. I know about that it. you and I know, the, I know, um, I know, because we've talked about this, too. And it, 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 it I think it really puts life into you. And yeah. I see you doing it on social media. And I, I think there's a sustenance to that, that. Um, maybe because you're so recalcitrant, you're refusing to just <laughs> embrace, you know? There's a certain level yeah. of cynicism uh, yeah. with your post. Get out of here. <laughs> you know, right. I'm like, Fucking. I get you because I know you, but somebody else looking in would be like, yeah. you know. The, but do you see the point that I'm making though? I, I do, that but I, I, but I feel like we put a lot of pressure on people who are uh -huh. newly sober to be too good, to give back too much, too fast. And from, I don't think that's necessarily true, though. I think that's that that's that's a projection on some level, also. And what I see, and I'll let you finish in a second. But my question to you is: you you hold on so tightly to this ideology or this perspective, and my question to you is: what would happen if you just let go of all that? Oh shit! Here comes the next challenge, right? <laughs> yeah. The, uh, the war I, of art, just, man. Yeah. Resistance, baby. The uh, now I just feel like you and JJ found a way to poison me in Mexico, <laughs> yeah. so I would come in here <laughs> in right. a weakened state. <laughs> you <are>. Yeah, <laughs> you're like an injured animal, right? We now. actually like, had somebody feed you in right. Mexico. I'm some fucking bags. hanging on to this table <laughs> go so I don't fall over. Go ahead. The um, but um. But you see my point, though, about the, um, oh, you're replacing one addiction with another, that kind of shit. Like, I, that's not helpful. And and I, I think, uh, you know, the three of us and lots of other people, like, um, you know, survive, um, have survived bad advice or bad input or useless information from people like that early on. And that and it's it's stuff that doesn't propel you forward. And if anything, it's it's stuff that pushes you back and it makes you think like, oh well fuck this. I should just go have a drink and not mm -hmm. put up with this horse shit. You I know? get you. But I, I think uh a, a counterpoint to that is that we're not always the most objective um when it comes to our decision making, right? And you know, I think any rational person would say, like, if you have a big decision to make or you're acting in a certain way, like, run that by people that you trust and respect and get their feedback on that. <laughs> that's, why my I, that's why my I, mom lives four like, houses down, dude. I'll, yeah, <laughs> so, I'll be yeah. like, you know, thinking that I'm on this great path and it will take another person who knows me well that I'm very connected with to say, hey, man, like, I, I see you, you know, doing this thing over here. Like, do you ever think like maybe, you know, ba, 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 and I'll be like, wow, I never would have thought that. Or, you know, maybe I disagree, but you've been right about so many other things. Like I need to rethink that, you know? So I think it's just being a, a, a sounding board and, uh, you know, a, I need somebody to reflect back my own behavior because I'm not so good at taking on a stock of it because my ego gets involved and all my character defects cloud my perspective so that I don't see it clearly. I, I mean, I agree with a lot of what you're saying. You know, I mean, I think, and I think that, you know, and we've talked about this before that like, um, it probably would have benefited me early on and now to lean on people more than I do, you know, that like, you know, last night when I was like lying there thinking I was going to die, I was like, well, there's a good, it's a good thing. There's nobody around. Cause then I would cry to them. And instead of just laying there fucking by myself, you know, mm -hmm. the, uh, I couldn't even get the dog to come over and like <laughs> cuddle me. The, um, and I, you know, and I don't have any fantasy that like I exist in a vacuum and, um, I've tried to, and that's stupid. And that's mm -hmm. why I understand how stupid it is. And, and, you know, and we've talked so much on, you know, on this podcast about connection and, and the power of behind that of, I mean, that's the only way that I know to make sense of all this shit that we deal with on this earth is the connection between people, you know, loving one another, communicating with people, you know, so I, I absolutely believe in all of that. I'm just, you know, I, I just, the, I just think that we put too much on newly sober people when um, the, I think, I think people need to choose service. That's one of, that's one of my favorite things about you, dude, is that when fucking JJ was busting my balls about the garbage that I used to eat, you were always like, no, nah, it's fine. He can, he can just eat whatever, you know? And Did like, I say that? I don't the, know. I said that. Well, no, you <laughs> I said, don't think I said that. No, you, I mean, you were, you were like, you know, just, you know, 
try it for a month or try eating more plants or whatever, mm-hmm. you know? And now it's been whatever, two and a half years since I've eaten meat and I'm not going back. And, um, but also like, you know, JJ was like, I was chewing gum one time and you were like, here, aspartame. Fucking, you're like, spit that shit out. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> what the fuck? And I did, you know, cause when JJ tells you to do something, you do it. Uh-huh. But having the two of you having the good angel, and the devil, <laughs> one on each shoulder, <laughs> that have that multiplicity, that that was incredibly helpful to me. And that's helped me move forward. And that's for the same reason why I advocate for more, more ways of getting sober, um, you know, is when you have more options like that, you know, that, you know, it, it's like if, you know, to go back to the old tired analogy, you know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. You know, it's like it, when, when my cat doesn't want to eat, mm-hmm. you know, I, I could like shove her head in the bowl and she won't eat. But right. if I like rattle a little bit of food in my hand and then sort of sneak it away from her, she's like, you know, what's in your hand? You know, then she'll, she wants to say, oh, well, what is that? And then when she feels like she's getting something from me, then she'll eat, you know, I can take it right out of the bowl and put it in my hand. It's just presentation. I got you. I, th- I think we could go in circles on this for a long time. And I don't know how productive that is, but I have to say w- maybe one final thing and then we can talk about some other stuff. And that is that you cannot solve a problem with the same mentality that created it. And if you're fucked up on drugs and alcohol and you're making decisions in a certain way, if you think that you're going to solve that problem with that same brain that is making those decisions, then you're you're lost. Like it's it's not going to work, right? Like you've got to get a different perspective. And I don't think I would take issue with this this supposition that 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 12 step puts too much pressure on newly sober people to be of service. I don't think I, that's necessarily I wasn't true. even taking a swipe at 12 step with that. Or just, I, now I think it's just the the community at large. You know, that like know people who that. aren't. I mean, part- when you're when you're newly sober, it's all about like helping that person get sober and like t- everything else gets tabled until later until they've, you know, created Not in some my experience, dude. I've life. had people who I didn't even know well, there's like a fucking lot of come people at that me that are in shit. the programs that ain't the best. Right. Represent. I got you. Like Michael, let's take, for instance, Michael Alago, right? Who signed Metallica. He has the, the film. Who the fuck is that guy? Here's a person who's worked Cindy Lauper, Nina Simone. You, you want to talk about who's who in the music business. And he's never talks about it, but every single morning, no matter what he's doing, he goes in and he sets up the fucking chairs. He sets up the room. He gets the coffee. And the way I've seen him and the compassion and understanding and love and patience that he gives to newly sober people uh, it, it's 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 incredible, and that is, I think, what has the most effect. Uh, and the time that he gives of himself to call these people and follow up, never like being heavy handed. I don't think if somebody was heavy handed with me when I was coming off crack, I would have fucking knocked them the fuck out. To tell you the truth, it was people with a lot of compassion that were like, "Hey, man." Like, you know, this is what, you know, this yeah. is what How you How are you doing? How are yeah, you feeling? Like just What's going on? Some, some compassion there. Yeah. Like, I really felt like they were truly, honestly concerned for my well-being. And I think there's a lot of people that are in, those, in the 12-step program and NA and AA that do that same thing and um, have helped uh, a ton of people, you know, and, and Michael Lago is a great example of it. And- he doesn't brag about what he does. He doesn't put anybody's dirt out there. It's just, he's doing it. It's selfless service. He's not getting anything out of it because he doesn't even talk about it. But what you were saying, it helps his own sobriety. 100%. 100%. And I find yeah. it for myself too. It's When I'm talking to people, I'm constantly reminding myself of those same uh, facts, of those experiences of uh, of what it was like I can empathize with this person suffering and be like, holy shit, I was fucking there, man. I know what that person's feeling like. And now. also it helps you revisit that and connect with that so that you don't go back Absolutely. there. Yeah. The- uh, Tell you fucking wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, bro. The, uh, the, the best shows that I've had in this last year are 
we started doing shows at my house in Phoenix and uh-huh. just, and I, cause like, I know how fucking hard it is to get a gig and a gig that pays um, when you're on the road. So we've just been doing house shows for people when they come through. And so, like, I usually don't even play. I usually just, I host, I, we have a door that we took off like one of the. So your version of Bisbee, like Doug, <laughs> yeah. Doug's. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> The, uh, we, the stage is just a door that we took I've off. I've seen the, the fucking pictures, It's just, dude. It's just a like, door with a mic shit. stand. Dude, you, you laugh. Next time you're in town, you're going to do I'm one of there, those for dude. us, man. You too, there. man. But that's, those are the best fucking shows, man. And those are like the best nights of my life, you know? Like, but the happiest, man. Oh, my Because that's where you feel most connected. My friend Kristen Becker came through. She's telling jokes about fucking prolapses. My mom is sitting like right in front of her, like <laughs> laughing her ass off. And I was like, this is what it, this is how we make sense of like the fucking carnage of humanity is to just talk about everything together you know and to like to have all these people you might know, my, my uh my 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 bff robin and her girlfriend uh that man then sam and his buddy on their harleys there's we got the bikers and the lesbians and i was like uh oh and i walked over there and they're like they're both just talking shit about me and i was like all right cool we're good <laughs> we're good man. <laughs> yeah the, right but so i get it man you know it's like those I, and i live for those shows man they've been fucking awesome we're gonna we're trying to do them every month now it's cool know? yeah good deal man um so tell me about the new book that's coming out the um january this band could be your life oh god wow the, what's there's your other to, like uh, john reach there's there's mishka's book see at the bottom of that oh, stack yeah, yeah, right yeah. there the bo- i swear the i'll bo- make oh, it up yeah, to yeah, you yeah, yeah, the, the yeah. bottom of the stack huh yeah, the, uh, <laughs> yeah buddy i swear i'll make it up to you there we go <laughs> genius <laughs> i gotta get a screen cap of a john life on the there. low road <laughs> <laughs> You're a wordsmith, bro. I oh, swear to God, you. you fucking see. This yeah. is always my thing with you. Too. I'm so glad you've got <laughs> these two pieces coming out because I really think I love your writing, man. I really do. So um, it's, it's what I do best. Yeah. I got to get back to it. I've been fucking. You know, I love the road, and it totally energizes me. And like, it's time for the pendulum to you gotta swing live the other way in order to have stories to tell. But yeah, it's been too long. Those experiences, yeah, yeah. like, just is material for the next yeah. Yeah. thing, you know? The um, So in, in 2018, when I did the five months on the road, I broke up with my girlfriend, Maddie, in Atlanta because how can you keep a relationship together when one of the person, you know, one of the people is fucking mm-hmm. never there? And, uh, and I broke her heart and I broke my heart, you know, the, um, and then I couldn't even like feel bad about it. Cause I knew that I, it was my fucking fault too. We talked you know? about that when I saw you in London. Yeah. yeah. The, um, that was, I was so grateful to see you then, dude. I can't tell you, like, I was just so beat up at that moment. The, um, did you ever feel like you were going to drink again? Fuck yeah, dude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the, uh, I blame you and Rich for the, <laughs> for the my yeah. failure to relapse, but you did it, al- <laughs> but you did it alone. <laughs> I did it alone all, it with you, you with you I did it alone with you there uh-huh. we go the um no so this this piece is about uh in 2018 like whatever three months deep into this I took that uh that fucked up uh 1976 Chevy camper van mm-hmm. loaded my sisters and my mom and my uh my sister's kids into the van we drove 2,000 miles up to uh Saskatchewan for my mom for the family reunion my mom comes from a family of 17 kids and uh, and she had just lost her brother the year before, the first of the 17 to die. My younger sister, Tashina's uh, birth father. Mm. Um, so it was just, it was like really emotional. And then like going into it, man, I was like already insane by the time we got into the van. And it's like, okay, now you have to deal with four little kids driving through the ne- fucking Nevada desert at 115 right. degrees with no air conditioning. And like- Did Chung go? No, unfortunately, he uh, he didn't go. The explain the, who Chung is. Uh, Chung I mean, is. If you like, read, I swear I'll make it up to you. It's all like that guy's the lead character. Dude, I can't tell you how many messages I've gotten from people who are like, "Bro, I'm halfway through the book. I gotta know. Does Chung ever reappear?" I'm like, "Finish the fucking book, dude." <laughs> The uh, no Chung's doing good. He's uh, he's in Albuquerque. His son is actually going to to uh, to school in Arizona. So I'm going to mm-hmm. uh, try and reconnect with his son soon. But uh, Ch- Chung is my uh, Vietnamese foster brother. He was a refugee from Vietnam. Came over, spent two years in a refugee camp in Malaysia. Talk about fucking hardcore yeah, dude, man. shit that he has seen. The um, <clears throat> And uh, now he lives in Albuquerque. He, does, he has a landscaping business. Any, any of you guys need your uh, yards done in Albuquerque, hit me up. I'll hook you up with Chung. Nice. <laughs> the, uh, 
But um, but yeah, he was, and then he ran away when I was a teenager. He was gone for twenty years, and then just fucking reappeared one day. Right. And, like, and now he's 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 in your life now, though, right? Yeah, yeah. We yeah. Uh, we're, you know we we talk regularly, and you know text uh-huh. back and That's forth amazing. and stuff. Yeah. It's so a, all right, so this this family reunion, like, why? What what made you want to write about this? Like, what is this about? Well, I just you know my. Like my family, they're all like redneck oil people, Trump lovers, you know, the, um, the, you know, the only, only book I ever read was the Bible and that's good enough for me, you know, which I guess that explains a lot, huh? (laughs) Wow. I didn't just, just figure that one out Uh on air. The, um, the, but I love them all. I love them dearly, you know, and, uh, and I would fucking take a bullet for any of them. That's my family, you know? And, um, so I was trying to sort of like figure out like why, you know, why is it so important to me? And also like, I just felt like my family was sort of falling apart. My sister had gone through this fucking rough divorce and, um, you know, they were all on the West coast and I was in Atlanta and like been in New York most of my life. And, um, I was just feeling really disconnected from everybody. And then I was like, okay, this is it. This van is going to, this is like a time machine. We're all just going to get into the Scooby-Doo magic mystery machine. Wow. And we're going to travel together. And that journey is going to turn us back into what we were before, you know, family. Mm. And um, you created an expectation. There were a couple of bumps along the way, Rich. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but we survived, you know, we survived. And um, I've, I've, I learned a lot during that trip. One of the things I learned is learning hurts. <laughs> and, and that, uh, you know, the people in my family have an incredible amount of patience for mm-hmm. me and the bullshit that I submit them to. But, you know, but since that, it's been great. You know, I mean, my, like my older sister, Tatiana, and I, we had some shit that was sort of brewing up between the two of us. And uh, we ended up squashing that on that trip. Tashina and I had sort of not, there was not like... Uh, no, like bad blood really, but we just sort of fallen out of touch. And then doing this trip together, I was like, oh man, like you, you really chilled out in the last 10 years. You know, the, you're not the, the kid that I remember. And, um, the, you know, and then it ended up perfectly like Tashina and my mom and I like all live in Phoenix now with enough distance between us that we're not, you know, mm-hmm. walking on each other. And, um, and uh, one of the things I learned too from doing that trip and writing that piece was that I had to cut my dad out of my life, and that's been really hard, and uh, and incredibly liberating too. Mm-hmm. You know, there's like you, you know, you can pump a certain amount of energy into something, and at a certain point, you just have to say enough's enough. Create you know. Memory. Yeah. Did some, mm. Was it an accumulation of things or did one thing happen that made you? Well, I mean, there was a lot of shit, you know, like the, you know, politics now is like such, you know, there's I, there how many divorces have been caused by Trump's election, you know, like the, um, the, for a lot of friends of mine, they were just sort of like, fuck, who is this guy that I married? You know, the, um, and so that, you know, there's been that pressure with my dad, but I've been sort of, you know, I just skirted. I was like, dad, you're my dad. I'm not going to talk about this with you because we're just going to fight. So let's talk about fucking classic rock or whatever, you know, the, um, and then, uh, the, he, um, he was invited to my sister's wedding and, uh, and he said he wasn't going to come because it was, uh, like dishonest and deceitful or, you know, something like that. And I was like, yo, no offense, dad, but like you were fucking your secretary and you banded your wife and your children. Like you, <laughs> you fucking get those words out of your fucking mouth. Wow. You know, like we took you back. Like how dare you step to my sister and fucking, she, you know, she's got four kids. She's working her ass off. You know, she, she was a good kid. She wasn't the drunk. She wasn't the fuck up. Like how fucking dare you? So that was the line for me. He didn't do anything to me. Mm-hmm. It was my sister. But I was like, if I have to pick one, I'll pick her any day, man. Sorry to hear that. You know what? It's good. It's been good. It's really, it's like uh, a weight has lifted. And know? how does everyone in your family feel about the fact that you've written about them? They read it? They, they By this point, they tolerate me. You know, the, uh, <laughs> like, my, my sister's again. kids were like, how much are we going to get paid? I was like, fucking nothing. <laughs> <laughs> how did this come about? You were, you were kind of the golden child of the Kindle singles, you know, initiative, but that went the way of the dodo, right? Like they discontinued yeah. that program. I don't yeah. know why it was cool. 
Well, the, what the, happened over David there? Blum, the guy who created it, he um, left. He right? moved on to something yeah. else, and then they just sort of ran it into the ground where there was like just so much stuff, you know. The um, so then this is sort of a, a new sort of uh, relaunching of it. It's Amazon, Amazon originals. originals. Yeah, but it's basically the same idea. Yeah, yeah, basically, and that'll be out uh, January twenty first, and then I have an audio book coming out in March. We got to do a fucking audio book together or something. Some kind <laughs> is of is that what we're doing right now? <laughs> right. I guess a, a live audio book, <laughs> yeah. a radio play. Um, but that's that's the cold turkey one. How to quit drinking by not drinking. Right? Yeah, this yeah. is your this is your self help manifesto. Yeah, I feel so conflicted <laughs> about it, dude. Yeah, I feel. So conflicted. Oh, you, you know, gonna, I, I felt you deeply, be doing doing an edit on this after the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna be doing edits on you, motherfucker. You want me to, you want me to have a look at this before? <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> you no, know, what we should the, do. I haven't read it yet, and apologies. Oh for God, that. thank. Then um, don't read it. I, I, here's I, the thing. I was like, oh no, the way that Rich is acting, he's already read for the, it. <laughs> for the audio book, you could just take breaks every ten minutes or whatever, and then cut to me, and I'll I'll I'll, I'll like give you my reaction Commentary. to what you said. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. The director's you. cut. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. But that's cool. That's like a new, you know, uh, you know, you you're a master storyteller, but the kind of self help genre, you know, this is a new new like kind of thing for you. I mean, I know you've written articles for the Fix and things like that on on your sober journey, but is you know this what? An extrapolation I, like, of that. I, I'll be totally honest. I really didn't want to do it. I actively did not want to do it. They just hit me when I was fucking desperate and I needed money. <laughs> okay. There and you then go. I was like, okay, fuck, uh -huh. I'll do it. And then when I got into it, I was like, oh shit, I actually really, really care about this a lot. And uh -huh. this, in some ways, this is like my fucking life's work right here. Um, so it's similar to the long run. I didn't want to write the long run, but yeah. David Blum sat me down. He was like, nah, this is what you're writing, dude. Yeah. Um, so I just, you know, the... Yeah, it ended up being, you know, tremendously meaningful to me and I hope that it helps people. But that's going to be uh, audiobook only? Or yeah, you do yeah. That as a Kindle the, also. Uh, well, I'm going to talk to Bird and see if we can sell it as a physical book too. Mm -hmm. The but right now it's um it's just audiobook. Right. The um And JJ, you're writing you got a cookbook I you're working finished. on. Yeah, right? I was going to yeah. ask what you what yeah. you been up to. Uh man? just um finish. You got your YouTube show. Yeah, my YouTube channel The Hard <laughs> Truth. <laughs> yeah. His latest, did you see his latest video? It's like real men eat quiche. Oh god, <laughs> real men do fucking eat You're quiche. Right, exactly. There you go. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, I just do that for fun. I, I, I pay for everything, and uh, you know, just have a good time with it. Try to have uh, interesting people from time to time. Uh, try to get uh, uh, Roderick Sewell. You know, the first double amputee to finish Kona was oh, right. uh, supposed to uh -huh. come on. That's cool. Uh, and, um, you know, he couldn't make it. So trying to do that uh, coming up. And then uh, I uh, finished the cookbook. It's being edited. So it's like over 100 plant-based recipes and uh, a lot of the newer information. It's, uh, you know, out there to help uh, people, you know, to uh, lead a healthier, more, you know, productive so the PMA cookbook? Nah, it's it? not. It doesn't have anything to do with really mindset too much. I mean, I have. What's the title though? I'm waiting for your I can't self tell you. Oh, you can't Because you me? know what? Yeah. When I did Meat and Some Pussies, somebody I posted on it, and somebody fucking took Meat and Some Pussies dot com and all this uh. shit, and then they wrote me and they're like, "Yo, I'll sell you the fucking thing." I'm like, "Yeah, meet me on Avenue D <laughs> at two in the morning. I'll have the cash in my pocket. Show up, you know, like." So I just, uh, I don't fucking, uh, you know, good discuss. Call. And we got the 30 to life thing. Right. How's that? Is that coming it's along? It's good. Yeah, it's being good. edited. I just talked to Kip and, and Paul DeGelder, Kip right. Anderson, who did What the Health. And uh, it's, we're supposed to see an edit, I think, in early June or something, the first first edit of it. Right. But, I think we talked about this last time. Yeah. But basically, you and Paul DeGelder did, did this, um, like, limited series where- that's being produced by Kip from Cowspiracy and What the Health, where you go to these um, guys who have- Amity Foundation. Right, who have just gotten out of prison long-term. Long, term, long you know, like sentences. Multiple you offenders, couldn't even like fucking... hardcore guys, right? And you go in and you like get their diets sorted out. And, and, and Keith habits. Mitchell, the former pro, all pro linebacker, uh -huh. uh, did your, there was a lot of people involved. We had Krishna Das came and chanted with them. It was like- all different uh, people and 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 bringing different gifts 
uh, to the table to help, uh, you know, these guys because, you know, the recidivism rate in California is fucking like over right. 80%, I believe. If you do over 10 years, the odds of you going back to prison and then just seeing uh, the documentary, the thir- uh, 13th, about the 13th right. Amendment, the what they did to, to, you know, basically legalizing slavery in the prison system and just seeing people come out of prison and die and myself being incarcerated for two years and how I changed. I just took it to Paul and I was like, yo, I got this thing. And then me and him baked it and took it to Kip. And then Kip did, you know, we it was organic too at that point. You know, we figured that we were going to work with Homeboy Industries. That didn't happen. The producer that he had um, knew this place, Amity Foundation. And these are these motherfuckers went through fucking gladiator school. There was guys that did fucking 40 years, San Quentin riots, Chino. You fucking talk about people that been through shit. And uh, what got me the first day was one of the most hardcore motherfuckers that you ever seen in your life, this guy Hollywood. I named him Hollywood because I was like, this guy's a fucking star. And um, he fucking, we sat in a semicircle and everybody, we all went around us, you know, we talked, Paul, like they had seen Paul Mm -hmm. on Shark Week and if you don't know who he is, his No Time for Fear book, whatever, it's fucking amazing. Been on the podcast. Yeah, he's fucking just such a top act. And after we all relayed our stories and Keith went and the other people and then the guys went around the room, this guy got, he just started fucking, he just broke down crying and had to get up and walk the fuck out of the room. This is a fucking 220 pound dude who's been fighting for his life and and he was like, sorry. And he came back and he was like, I just never had people care about me. You know, and he really felt we weren't trying to exploit you uh, to get, you know, something onto Netflix or whatever the fuck medium it ends up coming out, a film, whatever. It was like he really felt like we were there to help. And, you know, because I had read this thing in Satya magazine and I talked about it, which Satya means the mode of goodness. And I read this like 25 years ago about this guy that went into the prison system and taught people to be plant-based and Buddhist and all this. And this prisoner said, if I had this knowledge that I'm getting now, and he became plant-based and a Buddhist in prison, and Mm -hmm. he was locked up for double homicide. He's never getting out. And I was like, that's so fucking powerful. It It never left me the power of the changes that I've seen in my life through through doing all of this and being of service to others and like Kip's people, the minute they heard it, like we gave it to Kip on a Wednesday, Friday, he had the funding. And then we just went in there, it's 30 to life, it's called, and it was 30 days and to change. Uh, it's a double entendre too, because like, I think right. 30 to life is the last sentence you could get before double life, mm-hmm. which means basically you're probably going to fucking die in prison. So it's like, and meeting these guys, and I'm still friends with them. As a matter of fact, the cro played the fucking, um, uh, the Roxy, and they all fucking came, and they were yeah. up in the fucking balcony oh, wearing cool. cro shirts, mm-hmm. all these dudes, and I just turned, and I got fucking choked up, man. I, I was like, looked at these dudes, and the place was packed. And I go, these motherfuckers right here, this is, these are my fucking family over here. And they didn't know what the fuck I did with the Cromax. <laughs> they were like, holy fucking shit. Mm. Like, and we did everything that those guys wanted to do if they wanted to play play guitar or get a job here or a chef or whatever. It was just amazing people involved and it, it's <clears throat> i met a few of them that that final day when you did like the 10k down and at the you beach. came and yeah. did the run so i got to it, meet a couple of and them and what was amazing right the whole community embraced those guys the running community yeah. they were just like they some of these guys never ran a fucking quarter mile right. much less what they did and and the whole community down there, the running community, were fucking waiting for every one of these guys to cross the finish. Right. And funny enough, you were like, we never ran together, you were saying. I know. <laughs> we, we, we still we, have it. This is the you, first I know. I've run. never run together yeah. either. 
how is that possible? But it's like well, it's not happening year. today with Mishka though. Yeah, you know yeah. this and, year. Well. And then Paul had him mm-hmm. jumping out of planes and right. fucking Keith was teaching him yoga. We took him to an animal sanctuary. Like they were learning about service, feeding the homeless, and one guy. Fucking dude, he was sold into slavery as a fucking child by his uncle or whatever. This guy, uh, John, and uh, in the South, and like fucking his whole life's been in prison, and he never met his grandchildren. And and the producers reached out to his family; they cut him off, and they're like, and I wasn't in town because I had to keep going back from the West Coast to to New York for other stuff I had going on, but. Like the producers and Kib told me, dude, the fucking those kids showed up at that airport with signs and balloons, the the world's best grandpa, and there's not gonna be a fucking dry eye because like, you know, I wasn't even there and just the thought of that, that they gave him a chance to reconnect with his family and meet his grandchildren and all this stuff. And he's the most sweet He's the sweetest person. And I always say that too. You don't know how somebody ended. There's a history to how these men and women ended up in prison. It's not cut and dry. It's, and, you know, it, and even addiction. There's, mm-hmm. a, there's a reason why people will slip into that. So you always have to have compassion and, uh, and understanding. And, and that's where, to me, I'm like this pay it forward thing really does matter because people reached out to me when I was a mess in 1980 in the Navy. I just came out of lockup two years. I was fucking hustling, selling drugs, beating people up, fucking. I was fucking, I was an addict. Uh, And people reached out and helped me. And and when I asked them, you know, how the fuck do I pay you back? They're like, you can't just pay it forward, you know? And it's Mm -hmm. like, that's what I try to do with, you know, Social media and and um, you know whatever the right. fuck. But are all your uh, issues with the Navy sorted out at this point? Oh yeah, I got snitched <laughs> on by my bass player Harley like, in '95. Tried to get me out of the way, but uh, yeah, it's, the paperwork's taken care paperwork's of. The paperwork's good. I even you got a you bank know, account. I do, man. Believe it right or not, on. I still awesome. don't have a license. <laughs> my girl's like, I'm not fucking going anywhere with I you know. until you get. Well, here's the thing: you come to L.A. and you stay with Tal downtown, right? Uh, well, you now, no now he has a girl, so I right? don't get to stay with him. I rent the Airbnb. Oh, you do, but you're downtown, yeah. And then you're like, hey, let's go to dinner. I'm, we're in, like, for people that don't know, it's like a two hour drive from where we are. Yeah, and I know, weren't you supposed to? Um, who was I with? Oh, Rob Moore was here the other day. Yeah, I was David supposed Sinclair. to go down to Santa Monica. Yeah, he and was, you wanted him to go like to Crossroads, Crossroads. and he's like, we're, going, we're in Venice, <laughs> dude. Good luck, man. Like, now get I'm a like, driver's license and rent a yeah. freaking car he's when like, you come you to got, town here or you just got Uber wheels? It. Like, I Uber. I Ubered right. here. I fucking Ubered here, but- uh, Only because, what's his name? The, the, was who was supposed to drive Jay you Soto, show. the <laughs> chef who's amazing. From the uh, series, from this, yeah. and you know what? Actually, he's great. He just posted yeah. up, and 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 I got to give this motherfucker props because he's still working at Amity, and he's been getting these guys jobs as chefs in some of the top restaurants mm-hmm. in L.A. And he just posted a picture with all these f- fucking guys, and it's like, you know, yeah. But he had some meetings, and he had we went late, and he slept in whatever the right. fuck. But he's he's my boy, man. I met so many magical people. Uh, through the through that through that whole thing, but yeah, coming out here, it's you know, hey, you know, before Uber, everyone avoided me. Like they'd be like, "Yeah, come out." I'm like, "Yo, man, what's up?" They're like, like "You got to drive downtown and pick you up." They don't answer <laughs> back, like, and then and then I heard through the grapevine, yeah, they're like, "That motherfucker don't got a car, and he has to get driven around." <laughs> that's he had to get into the fucking army. You know, that's shit. a classic. It's like I'll take my bike. It's a classic like rich man poor man thing. Like that's what super rich guys do, and guys who don't have two nickels do. <laughs> <You know? laughs> anyway, um, what's the next Iron Man? Oh, I got two this year. I'm doing uh, Saint George. I just had hernia surgery last right. year, which fucked me up. But I still got Cozumel done. Um, I had the I hurt my hernia sur- I injured the surgery on tour with the Chromax. I waited a month. The doctor's you like, had to yeah, cancel, you, can- you had to cancel a bunch of dates, right? Cancel fucking tours, big ones. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the thing was, my doctor, she was like, oh, yeah, you can go back to training and, you know, after two weeks. And then she's like, yeah, you could go and play. 
And then I came back off the road we because we had a stop in New York, and I went to see her, and she's like, I was like, yeah, I, I fucked up. I think I'm, uh, I fucked something up, like... And she's like, what kind of music do you do? And I showed her the video. She's like, I would have fucking never let you fucking get on stage and do that. Are you fucking kidding me? She's like, I, she's like, cancel the rest of this tour. I said, I can't do that. She goes, no singing. She cleared me for Iron Man. She I, yeah, not, you can sing. She cleared I did 40 me 40 miles 10 days after hernia surgery and fucking JJ does a couple of shows and fucking right. blows Yo, she out. was, uh, she cleared me to do the Iron Man in Cozumel right before Thanksgiving, mm, but right. she said no more singing. Right. For you like, can do the Iron Man, but no more chromatic <laughs> shows. Yeah. So like, I've been healing up from that, doing a lot of, like I said, salt baths and yoga and CBD oil, which I discovered, which really fucking this company, Zenja, helps me out. They, mm -hmm. you know, it just really kills the fucking pain and, uh, you know, and, and like that. But I got St. George coming up uh, May 4th in Utah. And then I got uh, Lake Placid, which I've been uh, wanting cool. to do for, for, for years. Nice. And going to be touring with uh, Blood Clot this year again. And uh, I started doing a lot of speaking engagements now. Um, you, thank you, by the way. You hooked me up with somebody that was trying to get in touch with me. I'm doing mm. like this r thing in Richmond when I get home. Cool. Through, through your blessings. Right on, man. Mishka, how's the running going? You got back into it. <sighs> Good yeah. until the last couple of days, man. The, um, yeah, I'm going to do, an, uh, I'm going to get back to it this year. I'm going to do another marathon. Yeah. The, um, this is going to blow your guys' minds, but I feel like, since I stopped eating meat and consuming dairy, I feel like I recover. Duh, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> no, hear me out, bro. No, I just been, I, uh... <laughs> the light bulb just came <laughs> I know, I fucking love that. It takes a while, like, yeah, but I, I fucking, I'm I get telling there you that eventually. like 4,000 times. <laughs> <laughs> The, uh, no, man, I mean, we, we, like, there, I feel like there's no word that's, like, more overused or annoying as, you know, inspiring or inspiration or whatever. But one of my boys, uh, Travis Reyes, is a comic in uh, San Antonio, or he's in Austin, Texas now, um, he, he was like, oh, this is going to be the, I you know, my yearly rereading of I Swear I'll Make It Up To You and I pretend that I'm going to get back into running and then it's going to fail. And I was like, well, let's do 50 miles together this month. And he was like all right, fuck it. Let's do it. So we did it. And then we mm -hmm. did a hundred miles the next month. And then I was like, well, fuck. Now we start training for a marathon, you know? Beautiful. Right. So, cool. um, <clears throat> recovery is good. You look slim, dude. You're yeah, well, yeah, fucking four days of throwing up. That'll do it for you, man. The, uh, <laughs> now the, um, I've been, uh, here's another mind blower. I've been wearing myself down to a nub, like out there on the road, man, like just eating garbage and not exercising and not sleeping and shit like that. And that's been a big thing for me is like, I'm really, um, I mean, you know, I'm not going to say I'm going to quit, but I'm going to try and like dial it way back. Um, and you know, I love my house. I love my cat. I love my girlfriend. I love my mom. I love my family. You know, I, I love doing these house shows and like really trying to, you know, the, um, trying to build a, a community in Phoenix that I can, you know, really feel like I belong there. Um, and getting, getting back to writing, you know, I, um, I edited Mark Lanigan's uh, memoir, which mm. is, that is the fucking darkest thing I've ever read in my life. It's fucking brilliant, but. Tell the, me who um, he is. I think uh, most, most people know him as the singer of Screaming Trees. Oh, He's also wow. put out like. Right. 15 incredible solo records. Um, you know, his book of lyrics was praised by Nick Cave and Moby and fucking everybody. Um, and uh, he's an incredible, I mean, he was a heroin addict, like living under a bridge, smoking crack, smoking meth, you know, like fucking done everything. And uh, I uh, tricked him and talked him into writing a memoir and then uh, Bird hooked him up and, you know, we got him a deal. Cool. And then we did this fucking book together and it was, I mean, I was like, you know, he's like one of my last remaining musical heroes. Wow. And Is the book out? Uh, it'll be out uh, in April. I think it's April 24th. Uh, come bring him in here, um, man, and we'll talk dude, about it. That if oh, man, if you could get him on the podcast, I made him laugh. Well, you're my, you're my, you're my hookup. The uh, I'll you do, I'll do everything happen. I can to make it happen. I made Is him it laugh through, through Bird, though. Uh, can, yeah, 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 I, we'll do it. I made him laugh once in my life, 
Uh -huh. It was telling him the story about drinking my own piss when I was shipwrecked. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, making that stony gargoyle laugh once uh -huh. was the most gratifying thing I've ever done, dude. It was like, he's, yeah, wow. he's just a legendary I remember ass. that. So did you co-wrote yeah, yeah. co or you edit? You just no, helped him I, edit I it? No, I edited it. It's, uh -huh. it's Mark's work. You know, the, I, um, uh, it was just sort of nagging him and nudging him and, you know, prodding him forward and, uh, you know, doing everything I could to sort of coach him through it or whatever. But it was, um, it, I mean, it's really been the creative experience of my lifetime to work That's with cool. one of my heroes like that. And also to be put in the position of working with one of your heroes to be like, yo, this isn't good enough. You've got to redo that part. Wow. Uh -huh. You know, that's right. fucking nerve wracking. Um, I'm also working on a screenplay. Um, I met a guy. And you through, don't even live in LA. I know. I met a guy through Mark. <laughs> we were like hanging out at Mark's house and I was like, I was shitting on LA and I was like, yeah, I have a screenplay idea, but I'm not going to like uh -huh. go around fucking talking to people at parties about it. And he was like, well, what's the idea? You know, what's the idea? And I told him and he was like, that's a great idea. Um, Ridley Scott is doing my next screenplay. Let's what? make this happen. And I was like, what? what? I fucking talked to one on? person. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, and he's great. In he's, Phoenix? Uh, no, no, it was out here. At, it was uh, out here. At Mars. Oh, okay. Yeah. Who is this person? Uh, his his name is Roberto. Uh, I'm going to say his last name wrong. Beneventa. Benta, uh, he just sold Gucci, the screenplay of uh, the Gucci family that wow. fucking Lady Gaga is going to play the lead wow. on. Holy shit. Yeah. So and he's a great dude. Super talented writer. Uh -huh. like very gives me good direct communication on what's working. So what's you probably not. shouldn't tell us what that's about, right? The, I mean, the, the gist of it is, you know, if you look at, you know, classic horror movies, the monster is like technology or like interracial marriage or marijuana, you know, it's always some social anxiety. So in this instance, the monster is addiction. Hmm. The, uh, I'll, I'll send you guys the, you know, the yeah, idea. Cool. Wow. That's I, exciting. I, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm psyched. You know, so that's that's the thing. This year is all about like fucking hunkering down, um, you know, getting back to running. Maybe I'll come out to St. George, drive out and yeah. uh, and hang out with you. Running. Well, not that you're, you're going to be hanging out that much. Running but and writing, dude. Running, writing, and getting my health, you know, fucking back to where it needs to be. Yeah. Um, and building community. Connection, Rich. You should try <laughs> there you it. There go. Don't try to do this alone, Mishka. <laughs> come on, man. <laughs> right dude yeah i love you uh, i love you too man it's fucking, he's the it's, best it's, i yeah. miss you bro you yeah. like it's, i know I'm, I'm gonna be back in uh in march for a couple weeks let's, okay let's hang out i'm let's in town get some food definitely let's run. bro yeah a lot of great places in new york now vlad the uh, organic grill and you know 100 so. percent. yeah man 100 yeah. percent. that's my routine Rich feels guilty if we don't go to vlad yeah he's well like here's a, my thing a russian like <laughs> Former martial artist, you know, opened his. I'm a creature of habit. Organic spot. And my routine is when I go to New York, I always take the first flight out. It's usually like the 7 a.m. or 6 a.m. out of LA. So it gets me to New York. It, it land. I land at JFK at like 3:30 or whatever. Uber into the city, get checked into my hotel, and then just and then walk to meet JJ for dinner. Like green, that's green. the tradition. Yeah, I'm like I'm here, and usually we go to Organic Grill because of our boy Vlad yeah. and the great food. But the last time we went somewhere else and I did, I was like, I felt so guilty. I was like, what? I know. And Vlad it was right around out. the we corner from Vlad. Vlad. But was Vlad's like, was packed and he, you know, sometimes I can't get a table in there. I'm like, I fucking created a monster. I, I, fucking, <laughs> I promoted the fuck out of this place. Now I can't even fucking get in there. But I, he's like, I, hey, I haven't seen, I, I just love the way he says, you know, my friend John, he wrote the book, Meat is for Pussies. <laughs> <laughs> like, He's a great guy. I know. He's Fucking so cool. He, I, I convinced him to get the restaurant to go plant based, get rid of the fish, the dairy, the, and he was nervous at first. I said, "Dude, your place is gonna blow the fuck up." But mm. yeah, we felt guilty. We were like, every bite, we were like, "Fuck, man!" <laughs> like, you <laughs> know, know, we ate around the corner, but uh, we got to get you guys to come to Phoenix too. You got to come and do an event. I'm a, that race is on my the, uh, fucking radar because I'm. Racing with uh, Wadi Inc., uh, the Hit Squad, and Heather Jackson oh, yeah. won that race before, and the I think Iron she Man trains the... the Iron Man. She yeah, trains yeah. down there too, right? With uh, 
you know, she cycles down there. There's there's room at the inn whenever you guys are in town. At the inn. Yeah. You really are trying to create your own Bisbee, aren't you? I, I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to fucking build my tribe, man. Right. Do you have any, like, pickup trucks on cinder blocks in the yard and stuff like <laughs> Fuck that? Fuck yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah, of course. Dude, I figured out, it's yeah. like, this my whole life, like, I lived in New York, like, 17 years. and then I fucking, I'll never forget you, going to your apartment in Brooklyn the first time I met oh, you. Dude. Imagine that, but in a fucking yard in a house. I was and like, like, I can't believe this guy lives here, man. I forgot that Wait, I'm, what I'm a country I boy, man. I was, I was in Greenpoint. Oh, right. Like overlooking the BQ. Greenpoint, I got some history in there from I bet, the 70s. Yeah. I bet. It wasn't the neighborhood. It was the apartment proper. Yeah. Like the way it was set up. Dude, that was the cleanest it's ever been. And your too. roommate. And like, it was just a weird situation. <laughs> <laughs> we, we chill on the know. floor and an alliance was formed. <laughs> All right. We got to land this plane, but let's, let's close it down with, um, you know, if you had to like pick a predominant theme of this conversation is sobriety, right? Uh, so for the person who is in that cycle, who feels stuck or doesn't feel like maybe they need to get sober or, you know, just hasn't really found the lifeline and something that you guys said today, you know, connected with that person or spoke to them, like, let's leave them with a little bit of direction and hope. Right. You want me to say something? Yeah. <laughs> you at first, you. John. I, I, get, I get a lot of messages and just because, you know, I'm out doing the music and the races and then, you know, the walking tours and just, and, and people hit me up. They're like, yo, you know, I mean, close to death sometimes with their stuff. And I, and I, I just say, look, you know, you got to get that. Everybody says one day I'm going to do this. When I, and I go, you got to flip the script on that shit. And you have to say day one. And today is my day one. And I'm not going to, and just take it day by day. Like they say, even in the rooms, it's like, you know, take it day by day. One day at a time. But, but it, you know, it's also those connections. Uh, 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 they say people, places, and things. Like I know a lot of the, that philosophy, and I think that that's the truth. And uh, staying around positive people that are doing, you know, positive things and are also... Um, you know, when I was getting off crack, I didn't go hang out with people that fucking had crack habits. Those people almost got me murdered because I wasn't, I had issues as a, from a childhood, whatever. So I succumbed to that. So, you know, get your day one, say today, I'm going to wake up. I'm going to replace all that other shit with positive stuff. Somebody told me that the other day. I said, every time you want to fucking get high, drop and do fucking 50 push-ups. Go fucking run. Go fucking eat good. Go read a book. Go watch. Go do something else that's going to allocate that same time you were going to give in to your addiction to doing something that's going to be beneficial to you and your life. And um, that's that's really, uh, you know, my message. And, and to reach out to people, don't... You know, it just cost my guitar player his life because the embarrassment and trying to hide what was going on. You you know, I think in the four, terms of the four agreements, we make assumptions and that's a problem. We assume people are going to judge us. We assume we're going to be looked down upon. But no, you'd be quite surprised how many people are out there that love you and have compassion and, you know... Uh, you know, they were waiting for you to step forward and admit, hey, man, I got a fucking problem. And that's number one. To solving a problem, you have to admit you have one. Mishka? Uh, I'm going to borrow a note from, you know, from one of the things JJ was talking about today and just say uh, you don't have to have the gun locked and loaded in order to make the decision to change your life. Uh, it doesn't have to be lowest ebb. It doesn't have to be blackest night. You know, at any point in your life, you're having a problem with, you know, drinking too much, using drugs, smoking, eating, just acting wrong. You know, that um, there's always a way forward. And uh, the <clears throat> I love this concept of higher power. I think it's fucking awesome. The uh, we can the next time I come back we can just talk about higher power. All right, and 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 <laughs> the and for me it's uh, it's been the connection the the connection between human beings and that's the you know that's the only th way that I know how to like navigate this fucking quagmire is through connecting with other people. So so not alone. 
absolutely not alone. Not yeah. alone. Absolutely. And let me ask you this: What is it about connection that gives you that feeling? Like that's where you can find spirituality because you can't put your finger on it, right? There is no tangible thing about that, but yeah. there's something mystical that happens through connecting with another human being that provides that healing. You know what? I was, when I had my old van, my little Toyota Previa, I was driving down the highway one day in New Jersey. And uh, I was, I pulled up next to this, uh, you know, Latino dude driving the exact same year, the same color wow. of the minivan. Maroon, wow. right? Yeah. yeah, I remember. And I just, I honked and I, and I did a uh, shave and a haircut. And he looked over at me and did two bits. And I fucking, I was wow. high all day just from <laughs> that, just that level of connection, man. Just reaching out and just being like, are you getting what I'm putting down? Right. You know, and, wow, and, like, that's fucking and we, we understood each other, you know, and like if I, you know, if, if you're listening, that's got to go in the cold turkey book. <laughs> <laughs> that's all it takes, man. You, right. can, you can move it's, mountains. It's the little that. things. Yeah. Yeah. I think. You made an important point, which is it doesn't have to be the blackest night. And and I think there's a lot of people who are suffering who think, well, you know, I'm not living on the street or I'm not in jail or, you know, I haven't gotten a DUI or whatever it is. You can always point to somebody who's suffering more or somebody whose condition is far more dire than your own. But the truth of the matter is, if you look in the mirror and you're honest with yourself, uh, to recognize that the elevator's going down, it's going to continue to go down, but you can step off at any point. That opportunity is available to you in every single given moment. It's harder to step off when you still have things to lose. When you hit that rock bottom, that's a blessing, right? Like, <laughs> then you're willing, man, because you'll do anything it takes. Um, but that doesn't have to be your situation. And the truth is, that's not the case for most people. Um, and to remain in the moment, right? To just yeah. stay in the day. I think a lot of people get caught up in future tripping, like projecting oh, ahead. Oh man, what I gotta if? I gotta go to this thing next month, and there's no way I can do that sober, a wedding or whatever. It's like you don't have to worry about that, man. You just got right. like five hours between now and when your head hits that pillow. Do you think you can make it until then without picking up a drink? That's it, man. Yeah. That's it. And you string those things together. Uh, I would supplement what both of you guys have said by just saying that. Um, it's important that you find somebody that you can talk to, honestly. Like, I know you feel shameful, you feel embarrassed, that same embarrassment that, you know, basically killed your killed your bandmate. Um, you've got to find an outlet for that. So find somebody that you feel like you can be honest with and like open up and tell them what's going on. Shame can't survive the light. And that is the first step to, towards like wrestling those demons into the ground. Definitely. Love you guys, man. I'm glad Same. we fucking love you glad both. We, glad um, we did this. Rich, super thank fun. you so much for 500 episodes, dude. 500 yeah. episodes. Yeah. Can't fucking believe it, man. It's, it's crazy. It's a massive accomplishment. Thank you. And we're like, we're all indebted to and you. And the right? talent yeah. pool. I mean, present I mean, company look at these excluded. Guys. Look at these guys. You know, you like, know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the PMA book? It should be back there. It might be in my. Uh, it it's not even on the show. No, I, I'll bring it out. I think it's I back in the, uh, oh, Meetings for Pussies is there. There you go. Um, yeah, man, seven years, 500 episodes. It feels like yesterday and also feels like 100 years. Uh, and but let's not forget, been, I got I to gotta plug this. Yeah, man. If you want to read an incredible fucking journey. I think that's the German edition I, you got there. Ach, <laughs> yeah. don't be klugscheiser, read the book. Um. <laughs> Listen, uh, to everybody who's watching or listening, uh, I don't take your attention for granted. And this journey that I've been on is solely the result of, of you gifting me with your time and your attention. Um, so much love and appreciation to everybody out there who took a chance on this show and has become part of this audience. Um, that means so much to me. And it is your uh, energy and enthusiasm and engagement with what I do that keeps me going. So mad love. And the Thanks, authenticity of, of what you do, that's yeah, what carries it on. And I always say one thing, mm -hmm. and, I'll, and it's that pe people can smell bullshit. And I say the bullshit detector, you might be able to fool people and get over on people, but it's always going to Fool me once, out. fool 
You can't that, be fooled. <laughs> so, oh, we're quoting G.W. Yeah, 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 Jr. We're now. not going to walk Get on down, that, man. You no. can't close with that. You can't, no. <laughs> no, but it's the bullshit detector and the authenticity of this show and what you do. And you live what the fuck you say. Yeah. You're out there fucking doing it. And like I always say, Prabhupada said, example's better than precept. And I don't know too many people that set a better example than what you do and how you affect people. And that comes across to people. They know, they they can tell that it's authentic, it's real. And, you know, fucking amazing 500 episode. Thanks for having us. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Next time we'll, thank you. And uh, next time we'll do it in a cramped hotel room somewhere. Let's rent the small. We're going to have to do it in Phoenix. <laughs> Roach at, at the, at somewhere. Ranch, <laughs> the backseat of his truck or something. All right. Love you guys. Cool. Same. Love you, Rich. Peace. 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 Lance.